I believe this is not um, a day for heavy speeches and all that. Um, so uh, on behalf of the American Business Council, I would like to first of all um, welcome our Commissioner for um, Trade and Investment, Lagos State, um, Falasha De Ambrose Mebedem. Thank you very much for making our time to attend. And um, at all key stakeholders, we have, um, we have from the consulate, the economic and political chief, um, a, a friend and partner in this whole business of moving forward um, the, the space of uh, startups in Nigeria. Um, so um, Dr. Michael Ervin and our dear, dear, dear um, associate dean, very much a friend to the house. Uh, sometimes we joke about the fact that we do we we just take up most of her working time. But thank you so much for being able to attend. Um, so that's uh, Professor Lainka David West, and we have the um, representative of uh, the Director General of uh, NITA, um here with us. Unfortunately, he was um, unable to come in person. So. I would just, oh, they have my picture out there, ha ha ha. So, um, yeah, thank you everyone for coming and over to you, Joseph. Thank you, Mr. Lily. Um, so, I would like to also call um, the economic, political and economic chief for the US Embassy to give his own opening remarks. That is Michael Evan. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Maggie. Esteemed guests uh, joining us from Lagos State, from Lagos Business School. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with everyone. I always feel like with these kinds of events, when we're talking about startups, I'm just like a big cheerleader up here for everything that's going on in Nigeria. And I guess what I'm here to talk about uh, today is about the future, not some distant theoretical future but the one being built right now, today, by the daring minds in the startup scene, some of Africa's finest in this very room. Startups are not just a fad. They're the lifeblood of any thriving economy. They're the jolt of creativity that shakes up old industries, the pioneers who carve new paths into uncharted markets. They are the engine of job creation, the launch pad for the next generation of groundbreaking technologies. Think about it. Stagnant economies crave fresh ideas, new solutions. Established companies, while valuable and fundamental to the running of any economy, can get set in their ways. Startups, however, are agile. They adapt. They experiment. They take risks. They bring fresh perspectives and challenge the status quo by asking, what if? This constant questioning, relentless pursuit of innovation, pushes entire industries and nations forward. Tradition is important, there's no doubt. It's what binds us as people. It binds nations together. Tradition alone, however, cannot solve the challenges of a nation on the rise. We need the dynamism, the fresh thinking that startups bring to the table. They are, you are, the mavericks, the problem solvers who see opportunities where others see obstacles. Think of this country's great and vast agricultural sector. Imagine a network of ag tech startups empowering farmers with data analysis and remote monitoring, maximizing yields and minimizing waste. Imagine a fintech revolution well underway in Lagos in Nigeria, bringing financial inclusion to every corner of the nation, to every corner of the continent, unlocking the potential for millions. This, my friends, is the future that you, the startups of Nigeria, are building. And let's not forget the jobs. Startups are job-creating machines. They may be small at first, but their growth potential is tremendous. They hire local talent, injecting a surge of energy and opportunity into our communities. Think of the young minds launching their careers, the experienced professionals taking a chance on something new. 
This is the fuel that propels economic prosperity, which is ultimately what the shared bilateral relationship of the United States and Nigeria is all about. It's about shared prosperity. Last year, the tech sector contributed over 17% to Nigeria's GDP, almost doubling the revenues from oil and gas. This means tech is a driving force, a fundamental force of Nigeria's prosperity. But startups are not just about GDP and profit. They are a breeding ground also for social good. They tackle some of the most pressing challenges that confront us, from climate change to access to health care uh, to feeding our families and future. They develop solutions that improve lives and leave a lasting impact. So they're not just, and you're not, just building businesses. You're building a movement. A movement that creates jobs, yes, good paying, future, pu future proof jobs for the youth, the architects of tomorrow. But more than that, you're creating a culture of can do. A belief that anything is possible with the right idea and the Nigerian spirit behind it. We've all heard the stories. The young coder, you've lived them too. The young coder who disrupts an entire industry. The social entrepreneur who tackles healthcare access in rural communities. These are the heroes we celebrate here today and every day, and their success stories inspire a generation. They show us that we don't have to wait for change, but we are and are all a part of that change. Of course, and you know this better than I do, because I have a government salary and it comes every day and you're out on the front lines of putting your future on the line every day. The road won't be smooth. There will be setbacks, there will be failures, but even those are stepping stones. Every failed startup is a lesson learned. Every failed startup is a valuable data point in the ever evolving map of innovation. It's the spirit that matters, the relentless pursuit of innovation, of progress, the unwavering belief in a better tomorrow. So what more can we do? How do we continuously leverage this vital force for social well-being and economic development? We need an environment that fosters risk-taking. We need access to capital for these young companies. We need to celebrate not just the successes, but the journey itself the audacious spirit that dares us to dream big. Realizing all of this, the US mission and the American Business Council launched in October of 2023 an associate membership category for US incorporated startups, admitting them into a community of established global businesses where opportunities can be expanded. I urge all startups registered in the United States to join the American Business Council and leverage the opportunities that exist therein. The United States has been committed to fostering collaboration with Nigeria across the sectors of agriculture, education, healthcare, power, technology, and other vital areas for development and economic growth. US venture capital firms have invested heavily in African tech startups with over 60 and 40% of venture capital funding in Nigeria and Africa, respectively, coming from the United States. Up to 60% of African startups are incorporated in the United States, and this figure jumps to 80% when considering Nigeria alone. In 2022, African startups raised $4.6 billion, translating to an average of over $1 million every two hours. Despite the global, down, global downturn in VC funding last year in 2023, the United States still accounted for about 40% of the nearly $3 billion raised by African startups last year. These numbers indicate that we have, and by we I mean the United States, a strong interest and an everyday interest in supporting the growth of not just the startup ecosystem, but the digital economy of Nigeria, of Africa, and clearly Nigeria is a key market in that equation. As a whole, the US-Nigeria startup venture capital scene continues to be an immensely important, mutually beneficial, bilateral quarter, corridor of cooperation. And at the consulate here in Lagos, we work with a number of startups 
to facilitate their participation in incubator and accelerator programs, thereby connecting these Nigerian startups with global markets. This emphasizes our sustained commitment, our strong belief in the viability and the potential, the potential that we are all benefiting from now of Ni Nigerian and African startups and solutions. One may wonder why such investments, not only by the US government but of our private sector, I think the answer is pretty obvious. US investors see the enormous potential and high returns that Nigerian startups are growing rapidly with many of them disrupting traditional industries. The quality of Nigerian entrepreneurialism is unmatched. It's been one of the most impressive things I've seen in my year and a half here. And investors are confident that in their ability to build successful businesses that provide solutions to not only African problems, but to global problems. Nigeria's technology and startup ecosystem is a beacon of hope, a testament to the potential that we are all living. Nigeria is, in a word, reshaping the future of technology in Africa and its youth are changing the world. Our Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, Joy Basu, who visited Abuja and Lagos in October of last year, was here to pursue opportunities to expand US-Nigeria commercial and economic relationships, and she put it best when she said, we, and she was actually talking to our team in the consulate, we, the US government, owes it to the world to help unleash Nigeria's talent in service to solving the world's economic and greatest problems. We hosted Secretary Blinken, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken in January. He was in Abuja and Lagos, and the message he brought from, directly from the mouths of President Biden is that the partnership the United States has with the African continent is critical. We are all in on Africa were the words of President Biden. Secretary Blinken put it differently saying, quote, Africa shaped our past, it's shaping our present, and it will shape our future. So this is why the United States is so committed to partnering with Nigeria, with the African continent, and if you wanna work with the continent, you work in Nigeria. When we think about Africa, Ni Nigeria is front and center. Largest country, largest economy, largest democracy. We share so much naturally as partners. And so we remain committed to supporting Nigeria on its journey to prosperity as we believe that a strong and prosperous Africa is good for the United States and is good for the world. To close, I invite you to join us in the consulate and I invite my consulate team to join you to empower these startups. We commit to investing in their dreams, nurturing their ideas, providing fertile ground for their innovation to blossom. Let's create a support system that celebrates risk taking, that connects them with mentors and investors because when our startups thrive, Nigeria thrives, the world thrives. They are, you are, unlocking the nation's potential, building an economy that is not just strong, but sustainable and inclusive a beacon of progress. And so let's believe in the audacity of our startups and let's build the Nigerian and American dreams together. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Irvin. Fantastic speech. Um, so I would like to introduce our critical partner our fantastic sponsor, EcoBank, to give her own um, speech, represented by Omo Puyi Odu, Head Global Corporate Nigeria and Global Account Manager. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you, Joseph. Um, good morning, everyone. Please permit me to stand on existing protocols. So, thank you. So on behalf of the staff and management of EcoBank Nigeria, we welcome you to the EcoBank Pan-African Center for the American Business Council's Q1 2024 economic update, navigating the startup landscape in Nigeria amidst economic challenges. Okay, uh, Michael is a very hard act to follow, but I will try. The Nigerian entrepreneurial spirit is undeniable. 
is prevalent in all of us. We are a nation teeming with innovative ideas and a drive to succeed. Every day, brilliant minds come together to translate ideas into businesses, shaping the future of our nation. However, we all know that the path of a startup is rarely smooth. Economic realities can pose significant hurdles, testing the resolve of even the most passionate entrepreneur. The Nigerian economy, like many others, presents its fair share of challenges. Yet amidst these hurdles lies fertile ground for innovation and disruption. It is with this dynamic environment that startups, with their agility and fresh perspectives, have the potential to become the engines of our economic future. However, navigating this landscape requires more than just a brilliant idea or a singular top-down approach. It demands a keen understanding of the economic climate, access to resources, and a supportive network. This is where institutions like EcoBank step in. EcoBank, with its deep roots across Africa, recognizes the transformative power of startups. As the Pan-African Bank, EcoBank plays a critical role in building our continent's economic landscape via our presence in 33 African countries, which fosters regional trade and investment. This connectivity creates a larger market for African goods and services, propelling economic integration. Our renowned strategic partnership with SMEs as well as fintech solution providers. We offer loans, investment opportunities, and mentorship programs specifically designed to empower African entrepreneurs. This facilitates business creation, expansion, and job creation across the continent. We are at the forefront of digital banking solutions. We provide integrated collection solutions and online banking services that make financial transactions faster, cheaper, and more accessible, particularly in remote areas, financial inclusion. Through initiatives like the EcoBank FinTech Challenge and the Elevate Program for Women-Owned Businesses, we are committed to providing crucial financial support, mentorship, and access to a vast network of potential customers. Our partnership with the American Business Council on this economic object is a direct reflection of this commitment. Over the next few hours, you will hear from industry experts, seasoned investors, and successful startup founders. They will equip us with acknowledging tools we all need to navigate the exciting yet often challenging world of Nigerian startups. We should expect to gain insights on understanding the economic landscape, building a resilient business, leveraging technology, and the power of networks. Let us all remember that the path to success is rarely linear. There will be obstacles, but with the right knowledge, network, and unwavering determination, we can only navigate and emerge stronger. This program is your chance to learn, connect, and be inspired. Equiband stands ready to support on this exhilarating journey. So let's unleash our creativity, embrace the challenges, and let's shape the future of the Nigerian economy together. Indeed, a better way is possible. A better Africa is within our reach. So let us join hands, embrace innovation, invest in our economy. Together, let's build a future where Nigeria, and by extension, Africa's economic potential is fully realized. Thank you, and welcome once again to the Afri Echo Bank Afri Pan African Center. Focus to a new horizon, connecting us with the one purpose to create and share opportunities to grow. Thank you very much, Ms. Odu. Um, I will just give a brief overview of the American Business Council for more context before I introduce, in two minutes, just two minutes, before I introduce the first panel, moderated by Professor. Um, like David West. Okay, so the American Business Council is the voice of American interests or American businesses in the country. Um, we are affiliated with the US Chamber of Commerce, which is the largest um, advocacy group globally. Um, and we work hand in glove with the US government to f help US businesses operate efficiently. So we have other sister organizations across 118 countries. Um, as Michael Evan rightly noted, um, the U.S. mission and the American Business Council worked to establish the associate category that caters to startups. So we have mem over 80 member companies. You can think of the big, big U.S. corporates operating in the country. They're all members of the, of the council. So basically what we're looking forward to doing with the startup space to leverage 
our expertise in advocacy and business development, um, and also market expansion, leveraging our networks across 118 countries as well. So this is, if you want to know more about the American Business Council, please reach out to any of our, my colleagues wearing this shirt and you'll hear more. So I want to go straight into the first panel who will be moderated by, which will be moderated by Professor Lainka David West. Professor Lainka David West is the go-to person for anything digital technology. The country, I even know the continent. <laughs> Please give her a round of applause. Thank you, thank you very much, Joseph, and good morning, everyone. Good morning. You've had breakfast now. Ah, show some life. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here this morning to talk about startups. And I think when we saw the lay of the land, it was almost like, oh, let's come and listen and learn and things. But listening to Michael, I want us to take a step back and really think, why do we exist? Because I think he had some thought-provoking statements in his speech. Why do we exist as startups or as anybody? And I think it's really about paying it forward. How do we ensure that we're creating value, not just for ourselves and our valuations, but also for all Nigerians? And he, you know, another thing he said was, Nigeria is a beacon to the rest of Africa. So if you think about that burden of responsibility, that means you're not just thinking about the 200 million in Nigeria, but you're thinking about the 1.4 billion in Africa. How do we make it work? is really what we need to be thinking about. And I think the conversations today are going to be in different segments because everyone has a role to play. Whether you're in the private sector, whether you're in the government, or whether you're part of other communities and other um, countries who are also here as enablers to support Nigeria. How do we ensure that we're not making the same mistakes and we can learn and leverage from what other people have done? So that's really part of what we're here to unpack. And it's my pleasure to start with this opening panel where we're going to look at um, the Startup Act and its implementation and progress. But before I do that, I want to also acknowledge and recognize the fact that one of the architects of the Startup Act is with us today, and I'm going to put him on the spot, Osareti Gobadia. And I think it's important to recognize the fact that this was one of these, uh, one piece of legislation that really came out quickly. And for Nigeria, it, that took a lot. So you can, if you think about this as an iceberg, the tip is, oh yes, we've got a startup act. But when you look beneath, what happened to ensure that we could actually get that act going? And we could uh, go through preliminary readings, first reading, second reading, before it was passed and signed by both houses as well as assented by the president. And those things don't take, you know, they don't happen overnight. Because again, we're in an environment and a society or a community where people don't understand what you mean when they talk about startup. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, I like having frank conversations, but it seems that everyone wants to be pretty and talk and just say, yeah, okay, you know, we're in, a, we're in a nice environment, so let's not bring our bush behavior here, but no problem. On that note, I will start and introduce my panelists. And I think my panelists for me, so you have to forgive me, they're all colleagues and friends. So we're going to have a conversation. And first is the Honorable Commissioner, of Lagos State Trade, Industry, Trade and Investment, Ms. Falashade Ambrose Medebem. And she's a distinguished leader and in her current role in private public sector. Please come up. And she's been doing this in different industries. And I think her, the knowledge she's bringing is also private sector knowledge to say, how do we enable public sector to really think about some of these things and begin to change and be that enabler, enabler that can drive private sector? 
So, Miss Am, um, the Honorable Commissioner has has a bachelor's degree in accounting, and then she's also got an MBA. She's a certified financial management professional, chartered insurance institute. So, prior to her role in com um, in um, government, she's been director of communication, public affairs, and sustainable development at Lafarge. And I don't know if any of you remember this, but she pioneered Lafarge's whole ESG movement and being able to actually come out and come up and do this in, in general. So she's been a woman in manufacturing and sits on several boards and really promoting sustainable development and economic growth. So ladies and gentlemen, a welcome and a, hand, and a round of applause for the Honorable Commissioner. Our next panelist is Mr. Chinedu Mofunaya, and he's the Deputy Head of Externally Managed Investments at the Nigeria Sovereign Trust Investment Authority. So he's the money man, right? And again, in this space, he has the record of unlocking finance, both here and in the UK and in emerging markets, his expertise in business strategy, project management, finance, and economics. Thank you, Chinedun. Chinedun, thank you. Our final panelist would have been the Director General of the National I I Information Technology Development Agency, NIDDA, but unfortunately, he's unable to be here. And he's been represented by Mr. Yakubu Musa, who is the acting national coordinator. Where is Yakubu? He's okay, there you are. Okay. Acting national coordinator for the office of the Nigerian Digital Innovation at the NITDA, right? So Yakubu is has a background in technology and innovation, and he we've done projects together as well in terms of driving NITDA's initiatives around IT development and the whole idea of promoting digital innovation and digital innovation policy. So ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for my guests and we'll get into the conversation. Sorry, do we have another mic? Oh, okay, great, thank you. So we're good. Okay. So I'm going to start with a conversation, and really, I think we've set the context. Michael has set the context. EcoBank has set the context. So let's just get into the conversation. And I'm going to start with you, Yakubu, because again, we're talking about the act, its implementation, and its progress so far. And please, ladies and gentlemen, I have another confession to make. So I am one of the members of the implementation committee of the Startup Act, right? So Yakubu is going to tell me why I'm unemployed or I'm not doing anything in that capacity. Pardon? Now defunct. Well, I didn't know it was defunct. So since authority is telling me it's defunct, so I'm putting that on the table so we're not, um, we're transparent about everything. Okay, so I think the first thing we need to talk about is really how do we, you know, when we talk about startups, okay, I'm very, traditional. I look at my little woman who wants to set up a kiosk and I'm like, oh, Mama Risi to selling her moi moi or whatever is a startup, right? But is that who we're talking about, Yakubu, when we talk about startups in general? Are we talking about every Nigerian startup or are we talking about a specific group of startups? Um, thank you very much, uh, Prof, and good morning, everyone. Um, uh, apologies from my DG for not being able to be here in person. Um, well, uh, in the context of the Nigerian Startup Act, when you talk about startups, you're talking about um, companies and their early stages, less than 10 years, companies that are tech enabled and are focused on innovation, really. So that's the definition of startups in the context of the Nigerian Startup um, Act. Okay, great. Thank you very much. And that's important to highlight. So we're not talking about every startup, but really innovation-driven enterprises and organizations that are less than 10 years old in general. So let me come to, yeah, let me stay with you, Yakubu. So again, tell us, where are we with the implementation of the act? And since the committee, the implementation committee is now defunct, so what is the, what, how do we look towards the future? and operationalizing the act, yes. Um, thank you very much. Um, I must admit that I'm in a hot seat <laughs> this morning. Um, but yeah, just to provide a bit of uh, background, right, following the um, enactment of the Startup Act, 
Um, of course, uh, NIDDA is desi uh, the designated secretariat for the implementation. And um, looking at the act, we found out that um, the vast majority of the implementation activities uh, would be done on the startup support and engagement portal. And for us to be able to have that in place, we required the um, approval of the National Council for Digital Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which is the um, governing body for the implementation of the act. However, uh, within the act, we also found out that um, for that to happen, also, we would require representation from the Startup Consultative Forum. And that cannot happen until we have the portal in place. So that was sort of a gap within uh, the law. But uh, yeah, we had um, lawyers within the house that uh, sort of leveraged the section 44 of the act that gave certain powers to the president. And we sought the approval of the president for us to commence the um, development of the startup support and engagement portal. Subsequent to that, um, like uh, Prof mentioned, we inaugurated the um, Nigerian Startup Act Implementation Committee, which was a 27-man committee comprising of representatives from the government, the industry, and um, the academia. And the idea behind the, the committee was for us to have that um, collaborative approach to the implementation of the act. And um, secondly, to also leverage uh, the expertise and experience of some of the members of that committee to sort of help uh, or assist the Secretariat in operationalizing the act. And I must commend the members of that committee uh, for their contributions because they contributed immensely to um, um, gathering the system requirements for the portal uh, in drafting some of the frameworks that we would require to implement the act. So, um, in a nutshell, that happened and the uh, portal was launched in November last year. Uh, we have received a registration so far. Um, startups, over 12,000 registrations for startups. Um, VC uh, registrations and also um, accelerators, incubators, around 1,000. And also um, angel investors, over uh, 1,000 uh, registrations. So, we're on the verge of the next phase, which is to really enable um, these um, startups to create their profiles, submit requir the required documents for us to go through and um, assess for the labeling process to start and also verify other stakeholders that have registered on, on the portal. In addition to that, we have, <coughs> we have had um, sessions for sensitization to sort of create awareness. We've had engagements with um, a number of state governments because domestication of the act at the, uh, at the sub-national level is also very critical okay. to achieving the oh. objectives of the act. So fantastic segue, Yakubu. Yeah. Because we're talking about domestication of the act, and you know, Lagos is that Silicon Valley of Nigeria. At least when you think about um, um, startup capitals within Africa, I think we have Lagos, Nairobi, Cape Town, and Cairo. So in Lagos, Madam Honorable Commissioner, and I, I've been corrected about your title, so let me try and get it right. It's a mouthful, but we'll try and get it right. For Commerce, Cooperation, Trade, and Investment. And it's a lot because you're packing a lot of weight in there. So since we're talking about commerce and the use of technology to drive commerce, to drive trade, to drive investment, within Lagos State, that is the perceived Silicon Valley, and Yakub just mentioned the fact that while the Federal Government Act is holistic and all-encompassing, we know that there are sub-national um, implementation guidelines that we need to take into consideration. So within Lagos State, how are you domesticating the Act? And then how are you also driving incentives across hubs, VCs, and all these people to sort of grow startups within the, that are registered within Lagos? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just before I answer, I'd like to say thank you to ABC for having me and also for Ecobank for hosting as well. Um, and just to also mention, um, Lagos State is beyond perceived startup. We are the actual. <laughs> we have a number of um, unicorns as well that have uh, sort of birthed in, in Lagos as well. Um, how have we domesticated it? Um, well, there's a lot of um, 
support. We are all familiar with the Ministry of Innovation and Science and Tech. And so we have a dedicated um, HC, Honourable Commissioner, who works very closely with a number of startups. And in addition, we also have a number of other agencies as well that we work with um, that provides a lot of support, um, particularly now in these economic um, challenging times, such as LTES, um, who are private providing single digit loans and grants and other capacity building support. Um, we've dispersed, I mean, and by that I mean Mr. Governor Babaji de Olushola Sangoli has dispersed just over 500 million in terms of story, about a number of 40 um, startups in terms of supporting and helping. Um, in terms of incentives and from an investment standpoint, which sits in my ministry, and we have a deal book. And as a result of that, we've engaged both at the federal level and also locally across all the MDAs in Lagos State to identify specific areas and how we can um, ensure that the incentives are indeed there. Um, I particularly have also um, revised and repositioned the ministry because um, under my mandate of managing um, commerce cooperatives, trade and investment, <laughs> um, part of my, my remit has really been trying to really be very clear about you know, my roadmap. And when I try and sort of summarize the overall vision for the ministry over the next of this entire administration, it's a 40 page strategy. I can just mention it in just three bullets. And the first one is about driving economic prosperity and trade um, and growth, I beg your pardon, focusing on trade and strengthening the organized private sector through MSMEs. Um, industrial sector, women, and I've deliberately and specifically also included startups for obvious reasons, which Michael eloquently um, alluded to. So I won't uh, go over the compelling reason why I've decided to bring in um, startups because startups really are the backbone as well and play a really crucial part. So um, it's evolving um, in terms of domesticating it. I really don't know if that's probably a word I'd want to use. I think it's more about making sure that we're all working and make enabling that ecosystem to thrive. And there are a number of parameters as to how we can do that right now. And I speak I'm pretty more very, very sure that there's a, a hub that we're creating under the Ministry of MIST, the Ministry of MIST. And that entire objective is really to try and bring in all these um, um, startups and try and make sure that we actually have a hub where they can actually thrive, where there's an ecosystem and the support that we can give in that regard. Um, so again, also working with um, you know the Startup um, Act and in adherence and according to that, that's something that we're also looking at. And also wearing another hat as a, an investor that I am and the experience that I have is really also about making sure that we understand what are the key pain points and providing the succor and support. Um, particularly in that um, regard as well. So watch this space, there'll be a lot more coming from us. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam Honorable Commissioner. So let me just throw in this one. You know this Lagos State I'm perceived. What about the Delaware LLCs? <laughs> They're all working with us. <laughs> okay. No problem. As partners. No, and I, and I think that's one of the things we need to change in this narrative as well, because whether we like it or not, a lot of our unicorns are uh, born in Lagos, right? But now bred in the US. And so how do we flip that coin? So I'm coming to you now, Chinedu, because money is part of the whole thing. There are two things from in, in our view that drive these kinds of behaviors. Access to funding and capital and affordable capital as well, whether and you do, people don't want to lose their shirts in the whole startup business as well. And also the, the second part is the enabling environment and our legal systems, etc., that also need to work towards the rule of law, adjudication, and ensuring that there's fairness in the whole ecosystem. So let's talk about the money part, because one of the mandates of the Startup Act, and I think it's about Section 19, says that you, NSI, and National Sovereign Investment Agency, will be the fund manager for the startup and also would have a seed fund, right, the Startup Investment Seed Fund, funded to the tune of 10 billion Naira annually. So 2022, that was what was said. So we've done 2023, right? And then 20, we're now in 2024, Q1. So to the best of my own mathematics, right? 2.5 billion a quarter. <laughs> so you should have no less than 15 billion in that fund now. So maybe you can tell us where we are with the fund and how do we now start to grow the fund and also what is the, in, what is the 
channel and instrument for dispersing some of these funds. Thank you. Thank you, and and thanks for thanks for having me. So, I think the short answer, and you and I know this, that the maths you raised, as we say in Nigeria, the maths is not matting. <laughs> but more importantly, um, or seriously, I would say, the section 19.1 of the Act says that the NSI would serve as fund manager, which is within our mandate. And I will talk briefly about what we've done in this space. And would serve as fund manager, and the 10 billion or so will be sourced by, will come from sources, paraphrasing now, that the council will approve. Um, and that's not very clear, right? But what we understand is that a lot of the things Yakubu talked about has to fit into that. That fund in itself um, will most likely be an outcome of certain actions once the, the act itself is operational and comes to life. Um, the NSIA has given our submissions to NITA and all the relevant agencies as to how we think that 10 billion can be sourced. Um, and I know that that's been, that's been worked on. But crucially, I think you can't do anything without funding. Um, you can't kind of accelerate the ecosystem without funding. And in our own way, um, serving as fund managers, we've done that. We've committed to um, five local funds, VC funds, um, across the globe, which because we have a global mandate, we've committed to 14. But what we try to do with those commitments is to ensure that there are synergies between what our diaspora, I would say, fund managers are doing and how we can create those um, synergies with our local managers. Do is there any way we can find a fund manager, for instance, in the US, who is doing something on mobility and try and link him up with a startup here or a fund manager here who has a portfolio company in the mobility space. There's a lot of information and that you can leverage and there's a lot of learnings that you can leverage from that. Um, also, we have the MPI program, the National Prize for Innovation, which is in its second year, which is largely to kind of catalyze and give that early stage, uh, very early capital to those ideas. Um, this is the second year we have um, about over 2,000 entries now. I think the, the submission should end in a few days' time. But that's, uh, and after that, we'll have a 25-man um, shortlist and a 10-man uh, shortlist. And we also have a, as part of the accelerator program is the trip to the U.S. by the, um, by the founders. So that's all being planned out. And we'll finally have a winner, a top three, a top three winner. Um, so, with that, that's our own way of, aside from the startup act, to catalyze and to help and to, and to help the ecosystem. Also, and finally, on the digital infrastructure side, we're doing a couple of things because truth, you have startups. You need you need you need the foil. You need the engine. You need the servers. You need the internet speed. One of the areas we see or uh, we're, we're we're trying to focus on is to try and help hyperscale data centers. We invested in one um, in, this, in the country v that will help kind of keep in-house some of this information and in-house some of this data. The same way we are talking about um, the domiciles, is it Delaware or is it Yaba or is it Lagos? The same way, it's where is the data kept, right? There's no point having all this information and you're now, you, you have servers outside the country and you're not able to domicile it here. So those are the things where, a couple of things we're doing in that space. Okay, th thank you very much. And I think um, you've all raised some of the challenges in the ecosystem. So let's sort of try and unpack some more of them because I think that while we know there's barriers to the writing of the law, to the changing of uh, the guard, to the, you know, to the different things that we're sort of all held back on, but how do we start to think about unlocking some of these barriers? Because whether we like it or not, like I said, the whole value chain of startups ch um, changing the narrative of socioeconomic development is still being held captive. 
So I'll start with you, Madam Honorable Commissioner, in terms of, you know, one of the biggest areas and challenges that we've seen, which again, we haven't talked about, is talent. And one of the areas of the Startup Act is also around how do we build and cultivate a talent ecosystem that can not only propel Nigeria, but can also serve the world. The Honorable Minister is also thinking about different initiatives around growing skills, growing talent. Well, how is, how is, what does that look like in Lagos? And how are you using the hubs and the taxi ecosystem to really drive and push the talent? And then, without, and then to retain the talent here, because when we take them to US now, the next thing we hear is that, ah, let me jackpot and things like that. So we need to keep the talent. So please, Madam Honorable Commissioner. Thank you. Um, well, one thing that we do have is the Lagos Startup um, Information Hub portal, um, which is actually um, of use to both investors and um, the startup um, actors as well. And so that just provides a lot of information. Now, when we, uh, I'll contextualize before I answer how we're retaining the talent, because one thing I want us to understand is that Jakbanism is inevitable. I think the true cross of it is that they go out and they come back. Jakbada is what we would like to have as a new um, word in our um, dictionary. Um, so in terms of the, the talent, I mean, I think what's going on in Lagos right now, should I even say overall in Nigeria, is quite remarkable. Um, right now, I think we've taken, o taken over from India in terms of providing digital services. Uh, you have a number of companies. I'm trying to remember the lady, the startup um, lady that runs this. Um, yes, I'm trying to remember her name. Alma, yes, thank you. And um, that, that's remarkable. Um, uh, we have a number of private sector actors and players. Just um, last week, um, Mr. Governor um, attended the groundbreaking ceremony, I think it was with Airtel, in terms of some of the amazing digital um, investment that they're bringing. And obviously with that, obviously if you interpret that, that comes with jobs. So again, Lagos State is partnering with all these key players. I certainly am also doing that. And in terms of the talent, I think it's just important, I just mentioned that we have a dedicated ministry of science, tech and innovation. And I'm sure we all know who Tuboson Alake is. He's a very, and we work quite closely and we do a lot together. The fact that um, I think, I don't know if I'm able to, I won't say it from a security standpoint, but we have some key players from Silicon Valley coming down to Lagos, one notably coming, um, you know, later on, you know, in a few days. So again, we're, we're you know, we're, we're doing a lot. We're ensuring that in spite of whatever challenges, and by the way, challenges are not just, you know, in Nigeria, they're all over the world. I mean, even with startups at the moment, they're facing challenges as well. And it was forcing them to start to look inwards, to try and really become agile, to diversify, and um, to be innovative. I mean, because that's what startups are after all, um, to be innovative, to um, leverage the power of networks as well. And even in the, you know, um, investors, I mean, angel investors as well, they have the, the power, the networks, et cetera, in order for them to be resilient and to thrive. So um, it's not a one size fits all, it's not a one Lagos state, it's Lagos state in partnership. Um, in order to ensure that this um, happens. And also, when we talk about Mr. Governor's development strategy, there's a 30-year vision and strategy, lsdp2052.com, and we've mapped out a 30-year strategy, which is also broken down under the Themes Plus. And making Lagos State a 21st century is one, and there are specific other um, sort of key um, parameters that have been called out. Obviously, I'm not going to mention them here. And I also have a Lagos State um, deal book, which we've outlined specific sectors and where we have the Lagos State Free Trade Zone as well, where we're also working and trying to encourage startups to come down there and to also, um, you know, sort of set up their startups or setting up an incubator um, operation there. And again, trying to identify and um, set up the right committees. And I mentioned the, um, the startup um, ecosystem village that's going to be set up very soon as well to try and encourage that. But all in all, what we're doing is really encouraging businesses, encouraging them to thrive and making sure that whatever the challenges are in terms of enhancing the ease of doing business, which is with my remit, um, I'm also working in accordance with our federal players as well. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Commissioner, I'm going to stay with you for a minute because um, I think you opened the hornet's nest. And so let's talk about gender and women. What are we doing to ensure that women in this space also have the right set of opportunities, access to funding? And you also mentioned that gender is one of the areas that you're also focusing on. So how are we going to do that? 
Well, happy Women's Month, and happy International Women's Day, everyone. I forgot to mention that while we're still in the month. Of, how are we going to do that? Um, the Themes Plus, Mr. Governor, Babajide Olushala Songwulu, under his second administration, added literally a numerical sign, plus. And that plus sign specifically um, is to do with gender equality, youth inclusion and social inclusion. And I'm gonna take it even one step further. How we're going to do that is to be very specific. And I like my analogies, I'll say it. Specifically, um, when we're talking about gender equality, if we use an analogy, it's like ensuring that every woman has a shoe that fits. Now, when we're talking about gender equity, it's ensuring that every woman has a shoe that fits her specifically. Do you understand? So where I'm going is that what we're trying to do is to identify there's several, every single ministry um, has a specific mandate to address that. Uh, Mr. Governor, obviously his cabinet speaks for itself. Everywhere and everything that we're doing is in accordance with ensuring that we're in a, um, working in accordance with the Themes Plus. Um, in terms of specific, I personally um, believe that what gets measured gets done. So legislation, I am specifically working with my federal counterparts, for instance, the Nigeria Export Council, and trying to identify those startups that we can work with and making sure that we're identifying women. We're having specific programs and that are specifically addressing and targeting women in the context of today from a startup um, specifically perspective. Again, it's really just identifying those female startups. And I'm happy to see that one of my private sector um, partners, I'd like her to stand up actually. Yeah, she, too. yes, okay, we all know her. <laughs> um, I plan to start to work with her and that's, can we all just, uh, she's one of the founders of, um, in fact, she is the founder of Rising Tide Africa. And essentially what that is about, and I'm happy to be a member of that, is really about driving. <laughs> you asked, I mean, at the end of the day, when we look at the UN women's, uh, um, women's report, according to them, it's going to take us 300 distant years to close the gender equality gap. And so right now, my, uh, my vision, and I take it that, and I say that on behalf of Lagos State, is really identifying those partners that we can work with. And the reason why I mentioned her is that it's also important that we identify those key formidable partners that we can work with to try and close this gap um, with pace and urgency. Great, thank you very much. And sorry for chiming that in, but I couldn't, Don't be I couldn't sorry. help. Don't it. be Don't sorry. <laughs> I'm not really sorry. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Yakubu, you know, there are many things that are sitting on Nita's neck right now. So how do we start to unlock? Because again, infrastructure is one of those key things. Um, Chinedu has said, okay, we're helping in that space. But for me, where, how, when do I can, when can I say that we're going to see the light at the end of the tunnel? And maybe, you know, when? Because I think that's really the bottleneck right now in that we have an act and we're trying to work out the kinks in the act to start operationalizing because we're only talking about the portal. There's still the investment framework. There's still the talent and capacity building. And there's still all those other areas that we started building frameworks for. So how do we start to drive this? And when can we say, oh, we're going to actually get everybody back on steam again and then start doing the work? Um, thank you very much for that, Prof. Uh, yes, of, of course, NIDA is um, the Secretariat for the Implementation, uh, but we strongly believe that we cannot do it alone, right? Um, there has to be that um, collab collaborative approach, a sort of participatory approach to the implementation, um, sustaining that big tent approach, and that was the idea behind the implementation committee. But unfortunately, um, the activities of the committee were overtaken by, by events. But um, we're in a strategic partnership with the GIZ, Digital Transformation Center, looking at um, a sort of a participatory implementation framework that would bring together all the relevant stakeholders, ensuring that NIDA works with all um, that is required to give it a push. Because like I said, we, we cannot do it um, alone, right? And we're also strongly advocating for um, the domestication at the um, state level. No, Madam Mitch, which you is said don't use that word, domestication. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're strongly advocating to, to see that the states also um, key into this um, um, initiative and sort of provide that enabling environment at the state level. So um, currently, I think it's um, uh, uh, ongoing development, having... Um, stakeholder input into that 
framework and I believe as soon as we have the framework in place, we'd really um, be back on track and ensure that everybody is pulled along and we give it a push and see how it goes. So other than the center of excellence, my state, which other states are engaged in this process? Because it's always nice to, because we have 36. So it's, you know, one out of 36 is fail. Yeah. So how do we start? To, and then again, Chinedu also, how are you going to help the states in terms of that implementing framework so everyone can be on an evil playing scale? Otherwise, you find out that you're cre we're creating more disparities across states in Nigeria. So how do we start to close that gap? Because everyone is a Nigerian and is entitled. Yes, uh, we have embarked on um, stakeholder um, sensitization and awareness across the states. Um, we have done a couple of states, particularly um, uh, in the north, northeast, as well as we, we'll be having a session in Lagos next month, I think, also. So, um, of course, there is, um, uh, in terms of resources, right, we would really require um, strategic partnerships that would really help or uh, assist NIDA in that direction to ensure that we do have this um, stakeholder sensitization session, as many as possible and bring all the other states um, up to speed to sort of understand the need and the urgency to really um, come up with initiative that would provide that enabling environment. When you talk about Lagos, of course, that's a different level, but we still have states that don't even understand what a startup is and what are the um, uh, economic prospects when it comes to creating that enabling environment. So I totally agree that, yes, we have a lot to do, but uh, we cannot do it alone, and we're open to really um, collaborating with all that would bring um, their own expertise, their own um, assistance in terms of all the resources that would require to ensure that we bring all the states um, into the loop and understand the urgency of what we need to do. So, Madam H, so let me just put you on the spot again. Hmm? Will Lagos State consider hosting peer learning sessions for other states to ensure that, again, their offtake can be easier and they can understand some of the dynamics? Absolutely. And I say that because, as um, eloquently put this morning, when a anything, or should I say a startup thrives in Lagos, Nigeria thrives. So, of course. And um, I'd also like to just give some examples as well. So um, when we start to talk about some of those startups that have thrived and that I believe can be replicated elsewhere, um, we have a number of them. Um, I'm sure all of us are familiar with um, the lag ride that we all um, ride on. And again, that wasn't a startup that we've encouraged through Bile Holdings. Um, we have the Lagos State Research and Innovation Council where we help a number of startups in terms of um, securing their paid patents and um, innovation ideas. Um, we also have, um, as I mentioned, the fact that Lagos State has empowered over 300, if not almost 400, tech entrepreneurs with the Lagos Innovates Voucher Program. There's so many that I have to read them. <laughs> the state is also um, laying a fiber optic network through the ongoing Metro um, Fiber Optic Project as well. And that's a 6,000 kilometer um, metropolis, which is obviously going through the third phase at the moment. And last but not the least, the Cowrie card, which we all know, which is to do with the um, red, blue rail first phases, by the way. So we still have the other phases going. And so obviously, these are just some very, very huge examples that I can share that demonstrate how we have not only enabled, enhanced, and also domesticated the startup back to Lagos. <laughs> okay, you. thank you very much. So, but, um, so Yakubu, you see that the Honorable Commissioner has opened the doors of Lagos State, not just to NITA, but again, to help all of us as Nigeria learn. Chinedu, what can the NSIA do? Because as a funding partner, as you can see, other than even the big ticket items, there's even the enablement funding and the support and capacity that we need. Is there any hope for the NSIA sort of stepping in in one capacity or the other to support this process? Because all, all everyone has been telling me today is about partnerships, linkages, partnerships, but so how do we also galvanize public, public private, um, partnerships to ensure that we can get this thing started? Definitely. Um, so I think it's important that we we don't reinvent the wheel and you know use existing infrastructure on ground to fast track the implementation of this act or things we're doing. Now, if you look at most of the GPs or funds 
in the early stage, series A, pre-seed seed series A, and B, in, well, most of them are, all of them are based in Lagos. They all have databases of startups, people that have come to them. Some of them have outreach programs where they go to universities and incubate ideas. And they don't just go to Lasso or the universities in Lagos, they go to universities across the country. That is a strong source of information that can be leveraged by all of us. Mm. What we tend to do as when we invest in these funds is that we commit to them, write a check, but also try to help them through the governance process as well. Because it's one thing to raise money when everyone is happy and when the market, so the last few years, markets were really rich. You could raise capital. You didn't need to, the investors didn't need to ask you a lot of questions. However, you have, it, when things are scarce or things are tough now, then your governance comes into place, your due diligence comes into place. So that is what we're also trying to strengthen. But more importantly, I think it's important to just leverage an existing infrastructure that's already in ground, and that's what we're trying to do. Okay, so I th I'm hoping that these would also roll into the portal so we can have a full comprehensive portal and then we're all using one single source of truth in general. So we're almost out of time, but ladies and gentlemen, I want to ask one question. If we could change one thing about the act, right? If there was, you had this golden pen and we could change one thing, what would that thing be? Let me start with you, Yakubu. <laughs> well, that's, that's a very tough one. Um, but to me, I would say, um, if it's possible, a pr private sector-driven um, approach okay. to the implementation. Okay, great. Private sector-driven approach. Yeah. Can you do? I think I'll concur with you. Okay. Madam HC? Well, the fact that the government can't do it all, I have to also concur because a lot of what we want to do and have to achieve in order to move us forward um, requires us partnering. And if you recall, I said strengthen the organized private yes. sector. So it is indeed a partnership. Thank okay, you. great. Thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to have two or three questions, right? But please, can we have some guidelines around questions? Let them be questions. That means they must end with a question mark, not comments, not pleasantries, not platitudes, etc. We would have time to network and have conversations with the panelists later, then you can give them all the pleasantries and comments. So anyone have any questions for any of my three panelists? So other than being a question, if you tell, introduce yourself, your specific question, and it's one per person, please. One per person, and then also which of the panelists you would like to address your question. I am the only one that is allowed not to answer any questions. I will just direct how the questions will be answered. So, ladies and gentlemen, any questions? My name is Victoria Fapi, and my question is directed at Chinedu. Um, he talks about working to mobilize additional funding beyond the 10 billion in the Startup Act. Uh, question is, what do you think might be a sufficient initial amount um, from 10 billion? And then today you funded five GPs. How much more? GPs, do you think we should have or you should fund to get more traction through the act? Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Hi, Victoria. Victoria is asking a question that uh, is about sizing the market and the landscape. So let's get the other question that we can have. It's the gentleman at the back. Yes, right at the back. Um, in terms of sizing the landscape and how much is enough. And I'm not sure if uh, Chinedu can answer that question because... 10 billion in 2022 is different to 10 billion in 2024. <laughs> so. Hello. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, my name is Ogaji Olorawaju. I run an AI lab. Uh, we're majorly around research and development for AI. So we've realized that our biggest problem actually is data. Uh, we're not able to find data. We're not able to centralize data. We're already working with NITDA uh, to centralize a few data across the country. But I realized that with Lagos State, yeah, uh, there's a lot of data and this is where the big cash is. How exactly is Lagos State working towards centralizing data? Because, you know, AI is as good as if there's no data, you know, and I don't want to continue to experiment and build small stuff. 
it's time for us to build stuff with really big data sets. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. So I'll let um, the Honorable Commissioner start with this access to, first of all, digital Lagos State data that's open and available for him to use. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your question. Um, we're evolving. That's one thing I have to say. And um, I'm sure we're all aware with, I, I can't remember, the underwater cable that was cut recently um, and that being fixed. Uh, it was something that came up. And I also mentioned that um, Airtel, for instance, had just um, established the groundbreaking ceremony in order to establish a big data center. And I think that's one of the big problems is how do we decentralize it so it's not necessarily at one location. And so that's one thing that's being worked on. And Lego State is certainly working with the key players in that regard. And specifically, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we're trying our best to try and understand how we can centralize that. But one thing that we do know is that we're working with the Ministry of um, Science, Innovation and Tech in order to try and establish that across the state. And um, so all I will say is that I will take your information and come back to you as well with the specifics in terms of your particular one. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Chinedu. Thank you. Um, so the first question as to how much more um, that how much more funds can we give capital to? Um, well, there are a couple of limitations we have. One is we have what's called our strategic asset allocation, and we can only we only have a certain weight to VCs, and um, there is no weight to local VCs. There is just a weight to v the VC asset class. The NSI is uh, the future generations fund is the savings base. So ideally, we are return oriented. So to the extent that we have um, the right GPs, we have the right return profile, we would look at it um, and we will do what we, we, we need to do. On um, the question on the 10 billion, um, the 10 billion in the act was in Naira. I think that was what, that was about $50 million at that time. Your guess is as good as mine what it is now. But I think more importantly is to how much of the capital needs to be, it's important that that capital needs to be recycled. It's important that that capital needs to be a base and to be catalytic. Now, to the extent that you're able to use that as a base to attract foreign capital, support capital, technical assistance, there are different ways to slice and dice it. That would be helpful. but. There's just a lot to do with capital, but we need to kind of get that base right first and use um, very deliberately, I would say, try and source this pocket of capital that can be used to enhance this. Okay, great. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for our panelists. And I in summary, I think what we've heard is the work has started, so let's not be without um, hope. The work has started, but it now needs to sort of accelerate to get the catalytic change that we want. Because if we're talking about using startups as an engine for economic growth and driving the economic tides, I think that when Michael mentioned the fact that the IT sector had contributed more to GDP, it's also from the telecoms businesses in that sense. So how do we start to drive the service side of the whole um, in ecosystem and really, really use this as an enablement for growth and development. So I think that I'm going to implore them, um, Yakubo, as you go back to Abuja, please kindly implore the DG of NITA, the minister, in terms of how do we kickstart this and jumpstart this. Um, Chinedu as well, in terms of how do we ensure that we can begin to improve the funding cycles, get the approvals required from the um, council, and get this thing started out. And I think uh, for you, Madam HC, just to congratulate you in terms of what Lagos State is doing, congratulate the governor in terms of driving these things. But, you know, like Oliver Twist, all I can say is, okay, can we have some more in that sense? So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much for your time, your participation. Thank you. Okay. So, in the interest of time, I would like to call Ashley Emmanuel to facilitate the next session, an interesting session. Ashley. Ashley is the Chief Operating Officer for Semicolon. A round of applause for her, please. 
Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Joseph. And, and thank you very much um, to the organizers of the event. Um, I'm going to use my favorite phrase, which is, please allow me to rest on existing protocol. <laughs> um, but it's a pleasure to be here. So I think um, we'll kind of quickly move forward because I'm excited about the insights that our next panelists have to share. Um, so I'll invite them to come up on stage and join me. Um, first, we'll start with Samuel Eze, CEO of RPASS. And I'll actually um, allow you to do your own introductions, so I'll invite the other panelists as well. Um, next, Modupe Odele, um, who's the managing partner of Vazi Legal. You're welcome. Um, and then last um, on this panel, we have Naimeka Clinton, who's the CEO of Spark Africa. You're welcome. So I think to start off, um, let's do some introductions. So I'd like you to just briefly introduce yourselves, your companies, and then because we're talking about startups, and now we have some people um, in, in the first panel, which by the way was lovely, um, well done to um, our, our moderator, who I think is a perfect person <laughs> to moderate a panel with government representatives, and I really enjoyed the contributions from all panelists. Um, but now we're shifting gears and we have some people who are, who are able to speak more from the operator side and advising startups more. Um, so I'd like you to just say a little bit about yourselves, um, your companies, and maybe share with us one, either one challenge you've had um, in running your organizations or leading your organizations, um, and or maybe one surprise. Um, so sometimes, we start the the journey of leadership, and we um, we think it's going to be difficult, but there's always some surprises in terms of challenges. So you can either just say a challenge you anticipated, or maybe something you didn't. Um, and let's let's start with Modupe, and we can go down. Um, hi, my name is Mo. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces in the building, so hello everybody, all the people that know me. Um, so uh, I run Vazi. And um, Vazi basically is a tech-focused law firm. We're very boutique, that's all we do. If you have real estate issues and issues with your landlord, we're not the ones you come to, right? Um, <laughs> all we do is we support businesses that work in the innovation space and then people who invest in them. So to answer your question around one key challenge for us, it's really unique because we created a business in a traditional industry we're trying to we're creating a tech focused law firm in a legacy industry right so that was one of the hardest things for people to take you seriously i mean look at my face i have a piercing in the middle of my <laughs> and they're like are you actually you know you know that's so so to do that in a legacy industry was um <laughs> was pretty difficult um the second one was also capacity for us because we had to train from scratch and what I mean by that is when you run a firm like Vazi, you realize very quickly that everybody that was coming from law school, the first time they were have, they'd never heard anything about tech law or tech lawyering. So any single person we had to employ at the firm, we had to train from scratch. But then, to now answer your final question about the key surprise, was really how fast we were able to build that capacity and it ended up becoming a blessing for us. So, yeah, I hope I did justice to it. Wonderful, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. And let's uh, welcome her again with a round of applause. Yeah, um, hi, everyone. My name is Eze Samuel. I am the founder and CEO of Alphas. And Alphas is a business bank that primarily provides financial services and a suite of tools to businesses of all sizes, from the very small to the super large enterprise businesses, right? To enable them either start, grow, or scale. So think about it this way. Um, today we bank businesses like Spa, supermarket across Nigeria, the Med Plus, the Tasty Fried Chicken, the ShopRite, the UAC, 
the pure life pharmacy amongst other very large enterprise uh, businesses right so the way we think about it is we have two major channels the modern trade channel which comprises of the large enterprise businesses caught across every industry whilst the second channel is the open market channel particularly i'm speaking to like the brick and mortar businesses um, the online um, smes amongst uh, many others right so um what was the biggest challenge we face i think for me i would say um, trust building trust with customers uh, particularly because when we when we set out to to start pushing on um, business banking in 2022 uh, we focused on the large enterprises now in that very space today has um, the only people you see partnering or working with them are the commercial banks right so being able to take out like the commercial banks take out the likes of maybe interswitch the likes of unified payment out of these different uh, business locations right i think for us it was a huge thing right but then we keep learning every single day and we keep capturing market and growing our market share thanks all right thanks very much and welcome okay uh good day good morning everyone so my name is namika clinton uh, i run spark africa spark africa is a qatari based company and what we do is we organize some of the biggest tech events in africa uh, from the Africa Startup Festival to the Africa Tech Expo. So basically, we organize big tech events. And then we work with some of the biggest investors, uh, both in Africa and in Qatar. And then we kind of connect investors and, and startups. So if you're building interesting products, interesting uh, solutions, we connect it to investors, both, both based in Nigeria and in Africa as a whole, and in the GECC region, that's the Arab region. Um, in terms of problems that we faced earlier on was, first off, we figured out that investors based out of Africa had a kind of myopic uh, you know, view of African startups. In fact, they didn't want to expand into Africa right now. Both businesses who wanted to work with us on our events and investors. So they figured out that you know, Africa is you know, a small region. You know, why should we be expanding? to Africa, is there really a market there for us? Uh, and then, um, but then I would see it as an opportunity, it not really has a problem because, you know, then we started inviting them to connect with already existing establishments and then they saw the potential. So I would say it's a, it's a really interesting activity. Um, and yes, we're really looking forward to many things that come out of it. All right, thanks very much. And again, welcome um, to our panelists. And I think Clinton, um, you've taken us in, a, in an interesting direction. <laughs> um, so when we chatted um, last week online, all of us, um, I think one of the things that stood out to me is um, the perspective around kind of cross-border um, operations um, for startups. So because this topic is very broad, right? <laughs> the startup landscape in Nigeria amidst economic challenges. Coming in this morning, I chatted uh, with a few people I know, and how are you? And everybody said tired, right? <laughs> tired and, and trying to survive. And I, I think um, there, there are a lot of challenges. But one thing I'd like to kind of talk about is this idea of region, kind of expansion out of Nigeria. Um, so I actually didn't introduce myself, semicolon Africa, we're um, driving digital transformation by building tech-focused talent in businesses. Um, so we, we work, actually I was just um, sending a message to the Honorable Commissioner for Innovation, Science and Technology because we, we work quite a bit in the tech talent space. Um, but we also do venture building. We work with startups. Um, we have a, at least one portfolio company here. Um, do some training, including in partnership with Legos Business School and Henley Business School to try to really um, build investable startups who are solving problems and creating jobs. And I know for having seen so many pitch decks, right? Um, a lot of us start operations in Nigeria. Maybe we register in Delaware, um, or uh, you know, the UK is also making their push, right, <laughs> to get companies to register there. Um, but in our, when we're looking at market sizing, um, we're not just looking at Nigeria. Um, okay, the market is bigger than some other African markets, um, but most of us. Um, from the very early stages are looking at least pan-Africa in terms of our market size. Um, that being said, 
Um, as, as has already been mentioned, we're in a challenging landscape generally, uh, challenging fundraising environment. And for many companies, the way um, that we fund scaling is through you know, equity investment, um, et cetera. So I, I'm interested in your perspectives on um, how, how do you, what are some considerations you think um, that Nigerian startups should be thinking about um, when they're thinking about um, expanding outside of Nigeria? And I think I'll just open that to all of the panelists. The key thing that, that we see from where we sit is there's a lot of there's a lot of biases because um, when when startups I mean it looks very pretty on the pitch deck I have this amazing idea I'm going to expand to you know all 54 countries in Africa within five years and you know it just looks nice is it practical no um, also because the continent unfortunately I mean colonialism really did a number is that you have this very vast, you know, land. Um, but what it also means is, I mean, when you just look at Francophone Africa and Anglophone Africa, it tells you already very different legal systems. So people have the, so we see this all the time, right? People come to us and then they tell us they want to do this. And then they try to just move to Togo, which you can literally, you can walk from here to Togo if you want. But if you want to expand your company, then you would see how difficult it is, right? So just, you know, your neighbor Togo, you're like, oh, let me just do that. And they quickly realize that I've come with all of these biases that just doesn't play in this ecosystem. So it takes a lot of humility, I think, especially because of the size of the Nigerian economy. It makes us very, it, make, it makes us preoccupied. It keeps us very busy. You know, Nigeria's, Nigeria's issues and problems are so numerous that you know it's almost impossible to think about everybody else or anybody else. So you're just like thinking about yourself, and then you assume that you know the challenges that you face and how you face them is exactly how you know you would expand to other countries. So I do think that that humility and that stepping back is the first step that needs to happen, really on learning. Because there's a way the inefficiencies in the system also causes you to adapt as an entrepreneur that doesn't really translate to other places, even within your ecosystem. So just taking, you know, taking a step back, relearning and unlearning a lot of things, I think is usually the first step that needs to happen. Then the second thing for me is also trying to see, especially in this climate where you know, capital is scarce, People are trying to figure out what's the best way for me to get revenues that doesn't depend on one economy. Is really looking at places around the continent where possibly not a big attractive market, but somewhere that you can easily go to and um, do a proof of concept, right? I think that that's something that is missing that a lot of us are not looking at. Um, I mean, Gambia, for instance, comes to mind. I was in Gambia recently, and I was looking at the, the tech ecosystem, and I was like, English speaking, you know, it shares a border with Senegal. You can easily go there cheaply, try and do a proof of concept, see if it works, and then you can replicate. But I didn't really see a lot of, you know, almost nothing there. So just to answer your questions, those are the two things I would say, really on learning biases, and then secondly, looking for very easy places where you can do you know, an easy, cheaper proof of concepts, right, when you're expanding. Thank you, I think that's really insightful. I, I mean, it's interesting to hear reference to the Gambia because I think it's 500,000 people, right? <laughs> so you're, it's, it's an interesting point because it's probably a market that most overlook. Um, I know the um, minister for um, kind of digital economy, I've, I've forgotten her exact title, from Sierra Leone and a delegation were here a few weeks ago trying to sort of, and I think that's maybe similar, right? A, a bit of a smaller market, um, but if government is receptive, you know, could be a, a place to kind of build that proof of concept. Thank you. Um, so I think Mo has actually said a whole lot. Um, however, from where I sit, I would say before the investment downturn that happened, like I think sometime early last year, what we were hearing like everywhere on social media was, oh, we're launching in Kenya, 
we're launching in the US, we're launching in Canada. Uh, but today, we're no longer hearing we're launching in Canada, we're launching in the US, we're launching in Kenya, right? So, so I, think, I think as much as the heavy inflow of liquidity of funding, uh, as much as it was a good thing uh, into Africa, I think there was a downside to it. And the downside is in the fact that everybody just wanted to spend money to launch in every part of the world. Right. Um, the same way we think about industry expertise for founders before they launch a business in any sector, we can as well relate that to having an understanding of your market, right, or of any market before getting into that market. No one can simply give what he or she doesn't have. So if you're Nigerian, you've been fully based here in Nigeria, we expect that um, such person should be able to grow good market share in Nigeria before even thinking about launching in any other um, African country. If you're unable to grow your business in Nigeria, a place where you know people, a place where you understand like everything, how then would you move into uh, Congo, Kenya, and then you perform better than M-Pesa? We're all lying to ourselves. So, so for me, I would say let's stop all of the expanding, 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 expansion thinking. Grow, build here in Nigeria before any other one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Samuel. Clinton, do you have anything to add? Okay, so I, I think they've said pretty much uh, everything. Although I'm pro expansion, right? You know, I think that companies at some point, you know, need to expand to other regions. But then I think that before thinking, of, because at some points, a few years back, you know, it was a shiny thing, you know, for you to be to post on your social media that you're in Kenya, you're in Ghana. You kind of it keeps your competitors at ease, right? So, um, I think that it's you know it is necessary to expand, yes. But then before going about that, I think you need to figure out what what is your stake here in Nigeria first. You know, what's your traction so far? You know, and um, also a lot of attention needs to be given to expansion. So you need to do a lot of, you know, analysis. Does that market have your your customers? Right, because for example, I came in from Ken uh, Ghana directly down here, and then we are with the no uh, Norskin team, the, the Swedish Investment Fund. And so, you know, we are looking at the Ghana ecosystem, you know, how, how, how do we get them to, how do we invest more in Ghana startups or in Ghanaian startups? And then we figured out that, you know, in that region, the people there are not so, I, I would say they are not so enthusiastic. They, they, they are not really Nigerians that work hard. You know, for example, no, no, no offense, apologies no to Ghanaians. Apologies, though. <laughs> so, you know, so for example, they the, the say that they set up, you know, investment meetings, and these guys, we are not showing up. You know, investors set up meetings, accelerators, and they were not showing up, right? Now, but then that's, that's uh, for the Ghanaians, right? No offense, though. Uh, but then what, what I'm trying to say is that before, <laughs> before, before you think around expansion, you need to figure out two things. Number one is, what stake do you have in Nigeria first? Now, this is for Nigerian startups. What stake do I have in Nigeria? What, uh, what kind of um, progress or success? can I, you know, boost that uh, claim off in Nigeria, right? And just like Sam said, you need to be able to have serious traction, serious market share, you know, so that, you know, you don't end up going there and then you come back to nothing, right? So you need to be able to uh, have a lot of, you know, traction down there, market share. And then secondly is really put a lot into R&D. Figure out if the market you want to go to is something that they would accept you. You know, do, do you have customers there? And you know, on, on the other end, there's also investor side because they want you to expand. They want you, they, they want to see returns on their money. And part of the uh, you know targets is expansion, right? So, but I mean, yeah, seriously, you, you, we need to figure out about market share first, and then R and D in those countries we want to expand to. Okay, thank you. So I think no some... offense though to the Ghanaians, no offense, please. Because I'm I'm going back tomorrow. So. Please don't don't show a video of that clip. <laughs>
<laughs> they won't feed you. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I think we heard some useful advice, right? So for us being humble, I love I love that we started with that doing your homework, right? Doing the due diligence, maybe doing that proof of concept. Um, maybe we, I mean, as startups, we always need to continuously rethink our plans anyway. But maybe rethinking some of what we put in our pitch deck two years ago and experimenting. Um, and then Clinton, I like what you touched on last, which is around the investor expectations, right? So part of the reason that we all have going Pan-Africa in two years in our pitch deck is um, because we are, many companies, startups are seeking equity investment. Oh, hi, there's an investor. I just happened to <laughs> you, um, catch his eye as I was saying that. But many investors, um, so many startups are are seeking equity investment, we're raising in dollars, right? Uh, all of us, our graphs, our dollar-denominated graphs in, in 2023 were a lot more difficult to, to show that um, continuous um, meteoric rise, right? <laughs> that, that we all want to, to demonstrate. So does anybody have any kind of thoughts or advice on balancing that, right? The need to um, be prudent, be strategic, um, be sort of realistic about expanding into other markets, but at the same time needing to um, both manage currency risk, um, which is quite significant um, for us, the, the risk of earning you know, only or primarily in Naira, and also maybe managing expectations um, with particularly international investors. Yeah, okay, I can speak to this. Um, so I mean, when, when we had issues or when the down, downtown started, one of the key things our clients will come to us to ask is, hey, this question, I just raised in dollars, my revenues are in Naira, what do I do? So um, we've always, always told clients to report in the um, to report to investors in the currency that they're earning. This was even during the boom, right? Um, but now it become, becomes more apparent why you should, because when you think about growth in dollar terms, it sort of looks like you are working backwards. Um, but one key thing that I that I always say at every opportunity I get is we need to rethink venture as a model in Africa. And what I mean by that is when you think about venture capital and how it came into the ecosystem, I mean, this is what I've done for the last couple of years. It was basically a copy-paste model, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but for that model to work, it has to become adaptable to the particular context where you want it to work. And then this is one of the key issues, right? Um, people are raising a currency that is much more stronger than the currency that they are earning in. That's a key problem. Um, but that's a problem that doesn't happen in South Africa, for instance. Our South, Af South African clients don't have that problem. So again, that's because venture in South Africa, for instance, has been adapted um, to suit the local ecosystem. And I think those are the kind of questions that we need to start having and the kind of conversations we need to start having. Saying that, okay, this is how the venture model works, but are the returns that the investors even want Right? Can we get Silicon Valley type returns in Lagos? The truth is no, because Lagos does not have Silicon Valley infrastructure, does not have Silicon Valley um, you know, money in terms of people, individual earnings. It just doesn't have that. It doesn't have, um, it doesn't, it doesn't have Stanford yet. LBS, I know that you're there. Um, <laughs> So, um, but you know, you know what I mean. So we, we we are not there yet. So we have to be able to rethink um, what venture looks like for Africa. And then once we begin to have that conversation, then you now have a situation where people who are coming into the ecosystem have to follow that. And what I mean by that is, even when we have this flip, because I know in the first panel we talked about how a lot of companies are registered in Delaware. I mean, that's my bread and butter, so please register your company in Delaware. That's what I was saying. <laughs> but <laughs> if I was going to be a patriotic Nigerian, I'll tell you that this con what this means is that, you know, those returns, like when we were talking about, you know, companies that are doing Series A, Series B, Series C, those 
returns that you're talking about, most of them are not going to sit in Nigeria, except when you invest, right? Um, but for the, for the most part of it, when you have you know, a company registered in Delaware, that's what happens. Um, so we need to start thinking about, and most times, some investors actually just come to startups in Nigeria and they just tell them, I need you to register in Delaware. No reason, even the startups themselves don't understand why. And then so because the startups don't understand why, the investors, especially the ones that are not um, experienced investors, maybe angel investors, they just say, oh, that's what everybody's doing, right? And then they just go with the flow. But I do think that we have to start having a conversation around like, oh, you know what? My, my company is going to be domiciled in Nigeria, and this is the reason why it has to be domiciled in Nigeria. This is a fantastic opportunity, and if you want to come on board, you have to do this. And another thing I also want to tell startups, the people who are startups in the room, do we have a lot of startup founders here? I just want to see, show of hands, I just want to see what it looks like. Okay. Oh, okay, pretty much good representation. So I'm talking to you guys now, directly. Whenever an investor, you're having a conversation with an investor, except, you know, they're giving you grants capital or something like that, they're not giving you money from the goodness of their heart, even if it looks like that. They're not doing you any favors. The reason why they're investing in your business is because Enlightened self-interest, they know that there's a possibility that they will get outsized returns. So when you're having that conversation, you need to have that conversation from a position of strength. Because if they didn't think that, they wouldn't even have a conversation with you, right? A lot of um, investors are not, like, they're not doing charity except the ones that are, right? So I just wanted to, to have that conversation. So this still ties back into us being able to adapt, you know, venture to Africa. Once we do that, then our startups are having conversations more from a position of strength, and then the investors themselves become a lot more adaptable to the ecosystem. So that's it. Thank you, Mo. And I think the next panel, we actually have some investors. <laughs> so perhaps they can build on, on some of those ideas as well. Clinton, did you have something else um, you wanted to add? I saw you starting to speak as well. Um, so, well, similar though, but then this is why um, in as much as our work is to work with, you know, external investors, in international um, investors, we also want to work with local investors because, you know, when a VC, say, Norskin comes to invest in you, they, they don't want you to give them Naira back. They want dollars, right? And then this is what makes startups want to expand because they need to make dollars. Right, because if you travel, you're thinking, okay, I'm spending two K dollars. How much is that in in naira? Right. So I think that we need to have a, an uprising of local investors. I mean, NSI, we want to work with you. So because it, with 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 local investors, they they want naira back, right? Even though you know more than they give you, but then you know. <laughs> So, 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 you know, then there is no expectation. So, and then they don't have to deal with the whole Naira dollar issues, right? So this is why I think, you know, we have lesser local investors. And even the ones we have, we have that are partnered by the government, they are giving funds the government way. They are not giving funds the VC way, right? And then if you try to look at, okay, let us look at Lagos State government, for example, or the Lagos State uh, ecosystem. You know, you want to pinpoint, okay, who has received grants and, you know, or who has received funding and where are they now? So you can't really pinpoint exactly, you know. So, and then you, in terms of startups that are doing well in the ecosystem, you will see that they have investments from international investors, international visits, right? So I think that there needs to be an uprising of local investors. That there needs to be, you know, a re-belief of startups, investing in startups in Africa, right? You know, from the institutional investors to the angels, to the faces, you know, that, that are local. We need to start investing in uh, uh, Nigerian startups, in African startups, right? And, um, you know, yeah, pre pretty much it. All right, thanks a lot. Samuel, you wanted to add? Yeah, sure. Um, so for me, I would say uh, locally here in Nigeria, there are a lot of investors. And honestly, there is liquidity as well. A lot of it, right? <laughs> no, no. But again, that, that's my belief, right? And and I I feel like I'm right, hundred percent. 
Do you understand? There is money in Nigeria, like a lot of money. However, we are not ready to have the real conversations as founders, right? In the sense that you can't wake up in a country like Nigeria thinking about like the infrastructure that is available to us today and say you're building an AI company. It's not applicable here. You need Silicon Valley money and that has to be in USD. There is no local Nigerian investor that would give you Naira and say go and build an AI company. Nobody would do that. Do you understand? You need to build things or companies that are that are useful to our nation. Do you understand? You can't wake up and say, I'm building a WhatsApp. You need a Silicon Valley investor for that. Right? But if you're building a company that people can relate to, that you have the market, like the market exists here in Nigeria, honestly, if you can't access USD, you would access Naira. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for myself again as well. We've not raised... Um, I think we raised from Silicon Valley and a few other investors in 2021. Mo did the flip. Yeah. yeah. Do you understand? But moving into business banking in 2022 till date, we've not gone out to raise money. We've been doing everything locally. There, there's money in town. Right? You just need to show them this is where the money is and this is the business. People only invest in what they understand. Aside the follow, follow investor, right? And, and stuff. Sorry, sorry. I just have a question I, I know, for I'm coming. For, I'm for coming. Him, actually. I'm coming. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> yeah. Do you understand? Yeah, we. No, we... no. Hold on. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so when when you're talking about um, USD, the whole USD naira conversation, and the reason I'm saying we're not ready for this conversation is, in the last say maybe a decade, everyone has been building or trying to build in the Silicon Valley way. Silicon Valley is Silicon Valley. Nigeria is Nigeria. In fact, think about like the MasterCard and Visa, like the normal cards, right? Card schemes, like they created those cards with the mindset and culture of people in the Western world, not for Africans, right? Now you get the card, the virtual uh, MasterCard as a Nigerian or as an African where um, the way we think is, oh, let me fund this card with $50 and pay up like two subscriptions. When I'm done, the card is at is on zero. When it's time to resubscribe again, I'll receive a notification. Then I will go back to fund. But again, you get to forget because we're, as, as we're humans, right? Now they try to build that card or charge the card. And the next thing is they flag the card as fraud, right? So we have the, this... There's a, there's a culture difference in everything. So the moment we start to think as African founders, Nigerian founders, we'll build the real Nigeria that we want, not the Nigeria of 10 million users and 100,000 is active. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Quentin, did you, did you still want to come in with your question before we move on? I mean, now, now you've said it. It's overtaken by events. <laughs> so let me, I, I do want us to, to touch on one last thing, but I'd like to just underscore one theme I've heard so far is really that kind of taking our time to be strategic, to really understand local context, which is evolving, right? Um, to building solutions, really, you know, us to rethink um, individually as companies, but also collectively as an ecosystem. How are we um, building startups and enabling startups? Um, and, I, and I love that. Right? So let me just move to the last question before we wrap up, um, which is about that enabling environment. So coming back, we, we are privileged to have um, some friends from government in different capacities with us. So as we think about uh, and, and I love what has been said about the priorities, right? Both for US, for Lego State, um, at the federal level and so forth, in terms of really enabling the startup ecosystem and the recognition of its importance. Um, so as we think about enabling startups in Nigeria, which is already tough, and then also supporting the eventual expansion, including you know, making, supporting Nigerian startups and being globally competitive, 
what are a few specific things, I know there are many, but a few specific things that you think the government in any form, and this could be Nigeria, it could be US, it could be partnerships, um, could be doing to enable that? You can go ahead. When we're having this conversation, right, one of the things that we talked about um, was how when you're thinking about enabling startups in Nigeria, you can't think about it in isolation. The startups in Nigeria themselves exist within an ecosystem that has a lot of inefficiencies. So that's how that conversation needs to be had. So it's great that we have people from government that are here. Um, thank you very much for all your work. Uh, but that's, that's not how, like we're so, I mean, we're so behind um, that we need all hands on deck. And by all hands on deck, if you're talking about supporting startups, it shouldn't just be one ministry. You know what I mean? There's so many other ministries that are supposed to be involved and haven't gotten to the point where they're working in silos. A very good example, for instance, would be, I, I mean, when people talk about like the NIPC, for instance, you want to set up shop in Nigeria um, because we have a lot of clients that are trying to do the jackpada. Um, and then we try to, you know, you're, you're trying to create, you just want to create a company in Nigeria and open a bank account as a, um, as a person who has a foreign or an American as your business partner. You cannot imagine how painful that process is. It seems like a very small thing because you're like, it's just to register a company and open a business account. Most of our clients from outside Nigeria are from the US and it takes on average months for them to be able to get a bank account in Nigeria. So you can have that conversation about like supporting startups when you can't walk into, I'm sure Echo Bank is good at them opening bank accounts in time, but you can't walk into another bank <laughs> before they refuse to give me food or they send me out of here. <laughs> but I'm sure Echo Bank is good. So you can walk into another bank and just be like, oh, you know what? I have this company, I have foreign partners, I want to open a bank account. It takes weeks, months sometimes. So I do think that that conversation has to be holistic, a lot more holistic. We can't have the conversation in silos where we have just NITA and then we have just trade and investment. It has to be all hands on deck. So that's kind of like how I would, I I would look at it. I think that's great. Samuel, you want to add? Yeah, sure. Um, so I would say we still have a very long way to go, right? Um, uh, kudos to those who have been doing the work, like before now. Uh, there's still much more to be done. And, and for me, I would say it is a collective thing, right? From the government to, like, to the private sector, everyone just needs to put in like, their efforts, like uh, resources as well to, to get things in order. Because the truth is, if, if we do this well, it's, for, it's literally for everyone, right? Uh, however, I, I wouldn't end without saying, uh, so for instance, uh, this is uh, Oswald. Yeah, I think he was one of those who led the Startup Act bit and stuff. Uh, was it sometime last year? I think he probably tweeted or posted on LinkedIn saying, I think he spoke a bit around it, or I think at the end of um, the previous administration. Right. So since then till now, I probably have not heard anything whether Oswald is still working on the Startup Act and stuff. But he, he did a lot of work from ground zero, right? So my bi the biggest qu um, conversation here is where's the continuity plan? He walked, he stopped. Today he's here having the conversation of Startup Act. No, he's meant to be talking to us. No, no, no. These are very realistic conversations. You understand? So from administration A to B to C to D, whilst creating whatever, whatever initiative or anything, there must be a continuity plan. So when the next administration gets into power, that initiative is not stopped. The people leading it don't also stop. Do you understand? So think about the entire, think about like the progress they made with the Startup Act. Everything has ended. Anyone who tells you they continue, I don't know. It's ended. Thank you. <laughs>
Okay, thank you. Clinton, do you want to add any points that haven't been raised yet? Yeah, so um, I think just like he mentioned, um, I think there needs to be an intentionality around it. Um, so for example, um, at the festival last year, um, Will Stevens was a keynote speaker, and then he mentioned that his goal, in one of his goals uh, in Nigeria is to facilitate the expansion of U.S. companies into Nigeria, and this is a, this is their job. It's a, it is one of the goals, right? And then I think that if we start, if we stop seeing the whole startup startup thing, has you know one of those things young people do to you know they are building something, you know, and we kind of create a structure around it. That, uh, you know, I mean, that was the goal of this, the Startup Act. And I mean, I'm really looking forward to the success of it. Uh, and um, I think I wish the success of it, actually. And I think if we stop talking more about it and, you know, start having excerpts from it, you know, products. For example, one of those the benefits of the Startup Act was that, you know, comp startups have access to funding. And, you know, but then where is the funding, you know? And they launch, they launch funds, right? And then they launch funds, and there is no like clear roadmap of how to access those funds. You know, at at Web Summit, uh, the Qatari government launched a billion dollar fund, right? And then they knew that they can't invest these funds directly; they have to work with visas, LPs, and there was a direct funnel of how to access these funds. You know, you have to work in the Gulf region and the likes. So um, I mean, I'm, I am I support the work that the government is doing. Really uh, exceptional work, and uh, for the, everyone working very well. Um, but I, I think that uh, we just need to see more intentionality, and you know, creating structures around everything that supports the startup acts. All right, thank you very much. I think those were some really great points raised. So. Um, to summarize that last bit, I heard references to thinking holistically, right? So it's beyond, even though I think we have a uh, few representatives right here who are doing great work and running some programs that they mentioned, we need those programs, but also the big picture, right? What, what's the ease of doing business? Um, what's the ease of opening a bank account? I will say, actually, till today, I still don't have Nigerian citizenship, even though I've been trying. It's been 10 years. They told me now it, I have to wait till 15 um, <laughs> as a Niger wife. Um, but before I moved here um, and was married to a Nigerian, I traveled, I used to do, um, training for U.S. Agency for International Development, went to many different countries. Nigeria was by far the most difficult country to get a visa to. And I was living in Washington, D.C., close to the embassy. Um, till today, people are still getting, I know somebody two weeks ago was, was sent back because he was confused about visa on, it, on arrival, right? You can't, we can't be competitive with countries like Kenya, <laughs> where you just walk in, you pay your $40, in USD and you're in the country um, if we don't fix some of these these things um, kind of more holistically. So we, I heard about being holistic, being really strategic and intentional. Um, when we announce, um, when we undertake initiatives to maybe plan them start to finish, right? Or, or to have those implementation plans. And then um, as Samuel mentioned, the continuity, right? Across administrations across personnel. Um, even in the talent space, one of our biggest challenges is, I, I think my, one of my enemies is short-term thinking, right? Um, to, we're planting trees, and the trees are not going to finish growing in one administration, right? So how do we make sure that we have that longer-term thinking, the continuity? And then one thing I'm also inferring is maybe more transparency and, and communication, right? So when we announce an initiative, do we have a very specific action plan? Yes, we know that things will change, we'll have to learn and grow, but have we just set up a dashboard, right? <laughs> keep, keep people informed. These are the 20 things we want to do in the next 10 years. Are we ticking those boxes? Where are we progressing? Where are we stalled? Where do we need to change? Where do we need help from the private sector, right? And then maybe for us collectively as the private sector, how are we also organizing. I, I heard the last panel, I think the, the final recommendation from all the panelists was more private sector engagement and support, right? So are we also standing up? Are we working collectively um, to A, do the work and B, hold our government representatives accountable um, uh, for what we're paying them for? 
All right, so I think I'll wrap up there in this, the interest of time. Uh, I want to just say thank you so much. I, I could talk for another hour, but I'll, I'll let us move um, on with our agenda. Thanks very much to our panelists. Okay, so I'd like to call on Ni. Nee. Ni nee is a partner for CC Circle LLP firm. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll offer to you. Sir. Thank you, Joseph. I didn't give you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Ni. Nee. Um, Ni nee Emmanuel. There are a lot of Emmanuels on this panel, interesting. In this general conversation, there are about three of us. And for the first time, I'm seeing somebody who has a man with an eye, and that's Ashley, so nice to meet you. <laughs> um, so I'm joined um, on this panel by Tony Emmanuel Lubake, who's investment director at Nova Star. Please come join me. And uh, we are pressed for time, so we'll try to uh, push through. The other person is Ira Yola Dunjoe. She's uh, with Endeavor, she's the CEO at Endeavor. And then um, I have E.K. A.Z. from Better Ventures. Thank you. And then finally, we have Ehino Abulime from our host, Ecobank. All right, thank you very much. Interestingly, we had a pre-call before this session, and I had questions I had written and I had shared with the, with the panelists. And I'm about to surprise them now because Samuel ripped my script up. <laughs> and so I think, I think what he, do you mind if I stand? Is that okay? All right, cool. Okay. Oh, I can join. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Oh. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so Sam also sort of ripped up my script, right? When he was talking about the fact that um, there is money in Nigeria, right? As a matter of fact, one of the first questions I had asked was for, was for Tony. And we're talking about the $18 million that Nova Star raised in November. I'm not saying, I'm not putting you on the spot so people write decks to you, but. Um, but I think what we have right now in the ecosystem, that's probably known as the funding chill, the funding winter, I think it works to our advantage. It may not be a popular perspective, but I think it does, right? Because what it does now is that it's forcing us to have the conversations that we should have had before now. For instance, you're earning in Naira, you're reporting in dollars, um, you have currency fluctuations. Your Naira revenue is growing, but you're running on the same spot in dollars, right? And so um, I think to, and this, this panel is for the investors, right? So that is, these are the people who catalyze your ideas, who sponsor the businesses, but they also have narratives that they have to justify to raise this capital from LPs, right? And so I think the first question I would ask, and it will be to E.K. and Tony, will be, what's your narrative now, right? I mean, I think maybe Tony will go first, right? Because he raised most recently, except E.K. has raised some money that we're not aware of. So what's the narrative now to your LPs in terms of Africa, and what, does Niger what role does Nigeria play in that narrative? Do you need this mic? Thank you. Um, so to answer the question, to start with answering the question directly, um, Novastar is an Africa-focused VC uh, with commercial VC, but we do have an impact screen, social impact and now a climate impact screen. And I think our narrative has really, in, in a lot of ways, it actually hasn't changed because we've always had a narrative around the growth potential of Africa and it's a long-term view that we always take. And so even now with the currency fluctuations that are not just happening in Nigeria, um, what we believe and expect is that in the life of the funds that we're investing, the companies will outgrow these these fluctuations. And just last week, actually, I was doing some charts over some growth um, in the startup ecosystem for numbers that we had since about 20, 
2014. And even for Nigeria, the, the movement that happened around like 2016, 2017, in the long term, it, it looks more like this than like this, right? And so we believe that if you make sort of the right picks and companies that are able to grow counter-cyclically, meaning that they're providing essential goods and services, which is what we tend to focus on, then they will keep growing and those currency fluctuations will be smoothened out. So that's always been part of our narrative. Um, um, we also think that there is a climate imperative now and for certain sectors, Africa is in an interesting place. I say Africa not because it's one economy because like Mo pointed out, I don't think it is, but you know, overall there are a lot of challenges that are climate linked on the continent and we believe that um, venture backed innovation can really develop global solutions to some of those challenges. And so now is the right time, venture is the right tool. And we're finding a lot of the investors who are already looking at Africa or already thinking about climate, that narrative has resonated to them. All right, thank you. And just to stay with you for a bit. So, I mean, I don't know if this is something you can disclose, but in terms of your LP structure, right? What disclose? What do you say? I said probably can't disclose. You can't disclose. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I'll try anyway. Um, so, what's the what's the percentage of local capital in your LP pool? By local, but Nigerian investors. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so let's just say in in every way you can think of not not where one would want it to be and this is an interesting thing to the point that sam was making in the previous panel because when we're talking about um restructuring venture and things like that i think we also have to understand the 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 power that the source of capital plays for a lot of things like this a lot of times us-based investors will have a preference for companies being registered in the us not just because it's convenient, but because it's, it, for instance, provides a legal framework that they understand. Um, there are standardized deal templates to a large degree that they will use. So even their legal costs for transactions will typically be lower. So there are some reasoning. There are some reasons behind things like that that are driven by where the capital is coming from. And so, if we want to have those sort of similar changes reflected or adapted in this environment, where we're saying that okay, companies are then pushing to have their, their, um, the registration of the entities that receive the capital locally, then we need to be in a position where the bulk of the capital is being mobilized locally, and that puts you in a better stead to do so. Because, for example, if we think maybe just five, six years ago, a lot of companies, including startups, that were getting capital, not as much out of the US, maybe more out of Europe at the time, they were registered in Mauritius, right? And that was acceptable to everybody. Then, you know, Mauritius had went through a phase where there were questions about where it would sit on some of the um, um, sanctions lists and so on, like FACA and um, yeah. And so then a lot of shifting started to happen. People started going to Europe, more US investor came, shifted to the US. And so even, even some of the whole thing where there's a large portion of, of companies being um, registered in the US, some of that is more recent. But a lot of that really has to do with where the capital is coming from and where those investors are comfortable with. All right, thank you. So I think my next question is for, is for EK. And I don't know if you have any interventions or you want to speak to some of the points that I asked Tony as well, considering the fact that you're also running a fund. Um, I don't know how recently you raised, and what's, what's your experience on that end? Uh, I, I think that uh, one of the things that is not apparent to many people is that funds have lives, yeah. and these lives are typically 10 years. So when you start a fund vehicle, um, you really don't know what happens globally, or you might speculate as to what happens glo or might happen glo globally. But if you go in, dollars, you have to come out dollars. You can't change your currency mid-fund. Um, so for us, many of us that have raised dollar funds, 
Um, the vagaries in the market, you have to figure out a way how it dampens out and how you scale above that. What we look for is that our portfolio companies cannot be single country. So they have to be multi-country. Hence, the denomination is normalized into a dollar basis. And you might find that, like, Nigeria might be going through some changes, but Tanzania is not. Um, Botswana is not. Ghana is. Um, but you might find that Namibia isn't. So you have to find companies that can look at a pan-African view to dampen out a lot of these things, and that allows us to be denominated in USD. Now, the trend, we believe, is that there is local capital. And if you look at all the startups in Africa, there is a very significant amount that are based here in Nigeria. So we believe that locally, you are going to see some Naira-denominated funds, uh, which makes it easier, at least, to deploy. Um, we know that a few of our LPs are Nigerian corporates that, have denomina that are denominated in USD, but they would prefer to be denominated in Naira. It's so much easier for them to deploy capital. Uh, so we do th see that as a change that will be occurring in time. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I was going to ask a question, but I think on the back of this, I'd probably like to bring Ehi in, right, because he's with EcoBank, and EcoBank is one corporate that um, they have the, the, fin the FinTech challenge, I think, and then you have the sandbox, um, EcoBank sandbox, where, um, you know, startups can come into that pool, work with EcoBank, and you know expand or essentially hit the three markets at once right and i think personally that corporate venturing is probably one model that we need to explore more deeply here i mean if you look at the banking sector for instance in nigeria i think i think that that serves a model for us on what the startup ecosystem can be right because you have banks acquiring banks and access bank today is three, four banks in one, and things like that. And so corporates, I think, provide a path to exits, acquisitions for investors like yourself, and even for founders. And so what's that experience like being for you, being uh, with EcoBank? Is that something you think can be used by other industries, ex -note financial services? Is that something, is, that, is there a viable path there? Okay, um, thank you very much. And um, just before I start, I want to thank um, the organizers for having me. Um, one thing um, I'll speak about on the Soundbox and every other platform we're giving small business is um, levered on uh, what our founding fathers, right, the Setup Echo Bank, wanted to do. And that's um, trying to stir up economic development and financial integration within the continent. So with the Soundbox, I'll mention, I'll just say that um, the bank is not a venture capitalist, right? Mm -hmm. That's first. But um, we've also spotted that one of the key uh, parameters to succeed in as a small business is capital. Because in banking, you have three Cs for credit. Uh, Capital, that's capacity to pay back your character and your cash flows. But capital is very critical. And um, what we've done in our own small way as a private entity is to see how we can engender startups to actually stir up that um, economic development. Because um, before you turn into from a startup to a unicorn, you have to go through being an SME. And SME makes up like 50% of our GDP. Uh, that being said, uh, what we're doing at Echo Bank is to give in startups the platform to actually thrive, to um, see how they can be showcased to the world. Because a lot of people tell you, we don't fund dreams and all of that. Uh, but as a startup, you need capital. And um, how you get this capital, people will tell you, friends and family, or go and do sweat capital. But most importantly, right, Echo Bank has sort of partnered with all spheres of business, from the Adire Lagos lunch, and we even have a program coming up on um, Friday, that's the Plus 234 Arts Gallery, 
and all of that. And even a fintech talent from the group space to see how we can also give those incentives for real good ideas to spur up from there. So um, this is just like a clarion call to other corporates to take um, the stead of what Ecobank has done to try and also encourage the small businesses because I have a lot of respect for startups. That's why I respect my eight-year-old. When asked in class, what do you want to be? He says, I want to be an innovator. I want to be an inventor. So you guys are distorting the norm to make the world a better place. So we really, we really take keen interest in partnering with you. And that goes by saying that we even have a, an SME app to help train and develop um, small startups so that they can actually get information to thrive in. And sorry, I'll digress a bit because I've heard a lot of things about um, investors from offshore. Have they, have they been protected? Because they have a dollar balance sheet and you're coming to invest in a country like Nigeria that you have a Naira, um, where you have Naira receipts. Yes, we have the numbers. Yes, most call us the giant of Africa and we have the platform for businesses to really thrive. Well, how you protect that capital, you, you can do it in several ways, right? One is there are hedge tools, right, from credit default swaps, or you can even take in 2016 or 17, the central bank um, created a platform where you can actually buy hedges. They call it non-deliverable forwards. So if you get dollar investments, right, a sort of insurance that protects price risk movement. And that's, that's, that's also to say that when you're coming into a new uh, jurisdiction, a new um, geography, you need to find out the extent regulation so that you won't be caught in the web. Because we've seen a lot of companies being caught in that web. So when you're coming in, you need a good partner, a financial partner, someone like Ecobank, sorry, I'm not, someone like Ecobank to actually take you through the steps Know that you're getting when $1 million was 360 and now you're at one five and you're crying because you need to pay back those receipts, right, in USD. So you can go through credit default swaps. You can go through hedge solutions. We've seen lots of investors coming to tell us that, oh, we want to support a company in Nigeria and how do we go about it? We have dollars, but we want to go because we're going to get Naira receipts. So it takes a lot for um, startups or venture capitalists to just put in money and it, the capital gets eroded. So uh, you need good partners that understand finance that will take you through the journey and so, so that you'll be, you will have your capital safe and you can return it in one piece. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think um, I'd, I'd like the last bit you close out with about the, the, the credit hedge, what do you call it? The, the product. Hedge solutions. Hedge solutions, okay. I think that would work for fund, for funds. That would work for. I think my next my next question is to Iri, and I'm sort of changing the course of the conversation now. And the reason why is Iri, where you sit in. I think you have a very vantage position here, right? Because you work and your your endeavor is home to some of the best founders we have out of Africa, if I could say so. My, if I could say so, um, and. I think you probably would have a perspective to how they view this this funding winter, what the plans are, how they're equipping themselves. I'm not saying you should disclose their secrets, but what, from the vantage point you have, what do you think are the fungible skill sets or traits or perspectives that will be of use, of use to founders here? And uh, yeah, to founders here really. Okay, thank you so much for that. Thank you again for having me as well. Um, so when you say I see a vantage point, I'll say actually we, Endeavor is a community of, by, and with high impact entrepreneurs. And when we say high impact entrepreneurs, what we mean are those that are scaling faster. So not the SMEs, not the, you know, the ones that have actually done their seed raise, their pre-series um, A and series A. Um, and what I'll say in terms of, you know, what is going on, all startups, all founders are feeling the winter, not just in Nigeria, I think it's global at the moment. And what you find is you will be able to distinguish those that are actually solving a real issue, have, you know, I think it was Sam, I really do like Sam of Arbas, that said you'd have an app that has one million 
users, but do you ha and only have 50,000 or 1,000 um, people using it? You know, you have a, th a million signups and um, only 50,000 people using it. What you'll find uh, you need to be concentrating is actually having a profitable business model. So founders in our ecosystem are ones that have tried and proven their business models and you have to be agile. I can't remember who was on stage that mentioned it and you find that a lot of founders are quite agile. They're innovating faster than the law is, which is why we have like the startup bill that you, know, you move as the businesses are growing and being agile. Um, and it's also, you know, when you talk about the dollar, you know, getting dollar, um, dollarized um, funds, our businesses, most of the companies in our um, in our portfolio, are ones that are actually expanding beyond the um, the of the geography of Nigeria, and this is because we have we're in forty two markets, and the reason we're in forty two markets is understanding local the local and nuances in the different markets. But if a founder in my portfolio, for instance, wanted to go to Saudi Arabia where we have an office, they'll be handed over to somebody that has a local knowledge as well so you can then grow. And we spoke to um, you know mergers and acquisitions. You'd even see in our portfolios where they, we've had companies that have acquired other companies in our portfolio in different regions. So these are things that you need to, and someone mentions collaboration. You have founders that need to be open to being, to collaborating, you know. Um, when, I think it was also Sam that spoke to, we're building things like here in Silicon Valley, whereas if you look at Nigeria, thinking that before you even start a conversation, it's let's sign an NDA. But if you're in Silicon Valley and you're in Starbucks, you're not gonna be asking for that. So it's founders that, you know, building locally but also thinking globally um there will be challenges but in every challenge for a startup or founders i've come across is they see the opportunities as opposed to what the challenge is this isn't the first time that the market's had a winter we'll come out of the winter again and endeavor is 26 years old just over 26 years old 26 year old we started off in latam latam has experienced what we're, ha what we're experiencing in africa at the moment but you it's like the long capital the long you know like you stay um, you evolve, you innovate, and I, I believe that the stronger founders will acquire the little men in the ecosystem, but you'd see growth anyway, we'll come out of this stronger. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, mean, I think it's Jimmy Diamond that says that um, the recession is something that happens every five to seven years, right? Because the markets are cyclical, so it's up and down. But the point is, you want to be there when the waves, when the, the new wave is coming in, right? And you saw the point, the bottom line is just don't die, right? Stay here till, till that point. But Iri, I'll probably just stay with you again, right? And you talked about, I mean, we've referenced Sam's um, comments here a lot. And that has to do with the point about building businesses. Because, I mean, I see a lot of decks. I advise companies doing that. I write small checks. And a lot of, one of the quips you see is building the social of Africa. Building the building the this of Nigeria and stuff like that, right? So there's been a lot of copy and paste. Now, um, I think this situation would force us to sit down and say, how do we build businesses for our markets, taking on the nuance of our market, right? And so again, with your vantage point, I insist that you have a vantage point, by the way. <laughs> but yeah, so what qualities, maybe top three qualities do you see that's a common thread you know with the businesses within your community that's probably giving them this advantage and resilience i think just double clicking it i think you need to be agile for instance you have to have a business model that works you wouldn't like and if your business model is not working you have to be able to pivot if you, you know like how fast do you pivot do you stay on the program you, you need to be so um so in love should i say with the problem as as opposed to the solution because if you're if you like speaking on, if you don't, ha you have a million founders, a, a million use, um, signups, but only 50 users. Do these founders find out why is there only 50 people? If you started off with your, tr you're actually trying to solve a problem that has a million people that have a problem, and you've got in the app. An example I'll use, for instance, is when you have these agrotech businesses. You come with, you've created an app in your, in your lab, your sandbox. But when you go out, are the, are the farmers that you're actually trying to reach using your app? 
is it useful to them? And we can speak to that, like double clicking on that, where you have solutions. And I think I can speak to one of our um, founders, um, Money Points. They, they were dealing with the masses and they've got a solution for the masses, agency banking. Before then, you were, you were doing, an, you had an app that the average Joe couldn't use, but now you've gone straight giving the POSs to agents that then build a community because that's how our ecosystem works. We work with communities and little, you know, like as opposed to, everybody in this room is going to use the app. Those are the, the users I'm looking for. The people I'm using, looking for are outside. They cannot use the app on GTB app or you know whatever bank app and making the transfers. They would rather just use a POS. A money point has gone into the marketplace. And they put the POSs in the hands of the people that, you know, like of the actual users. Um, I hope that's clear. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think it answers. So the point is being, being agile. So you must be dynamic. I mean, that's, that's a major quality of, uh, of startups. And I think that probably brings me to EK now to talk about, um, we talked about the cyclical markets, right? We know that I mean, on the pre-call, you, you stopped me when I, you said, nee, we're looking back too much, right? Let's look, to, let's look forward. Let's have a forward-looking perspective about where, how we can take advantage of, and so, um, I'd like you to put on, maybe not Prophet's heart, but looking forward, right? What are the indicators, you know, that founders should begin to look out for that would show them that we are turning the corner? That's, that's the first question. And I'd like you to answer this. I'd also like Tony to also speak on this as well, um, on the second leg of the question. So the first is, what are these indicators that, you know, will show that we are turning the corner? And then how do businesses position themselves from now to be able to catch the wave, right, when it, comes, when it eventually comes in? Is that, oh, it's not too many questions. Not too many questions. <laughs> yeah, so let me play the role of profit. Don't put money against what I say, by the way. Um, look, I think, I think what has happened is that a lot of startups need to get their houses in order first. So you'll find that there are some ideas that are out there that, um, as Iria has mentioned, you know, you have a million users, 5% active, active usage. It's not a business. So entrepreneurs need to actually figure out, are they actually pursuing something that has market or it doesn't? Um, the other thing is that you have to look at the levers of how you position yourself for this turnaround. Um, and if your house isn't in order, your people aren't in order, the idea is not in order, financing is not in order, it's very hard to actually set up to do that. In terms of what we look at, it's grit. And I'll be very candid. We find that there are lots of entrepreneurs that like the concept of being entrepreneurs. They like the trips to Kenya, there was, there was actually, and this is a true story, so I can't even make this up. There's an entrepreneur, we believe, believe that his idea was a billion dollar company and we needed him to make sales. He couldn't make sales. Uh, one of the, my partner jumped in as COO and closed sales for him. Now he just had to deliver it. He found a way to mess it up, he did. They're running out of cash and he turns to me and says, I've been invited to Berlin to speak, can I go? I was like, dude, go where you want. I'm not putting any more money in. Uh, the company failed. Uh, so we believe that grit is a big thing that people are looking for. Surprisingly, capital is back in the market. Capital is back in the market from the LP side, it's back from a deployment side, we deploy cash. But the problem is that we need entrepreneurs to turn, or not, let, let, let me not say all, because we're investors in like Smile ID, we're the first investors in Nigeria, we sit on the board, we, that company turns ship really well. We're investors, largest investors in Be Free. They turn extremely well. So the new cadre of entrepreneurs that are in the market, we need them to be able to have that grit and to turn because if the opportunity is not where you initially thought it was, and the problem you're trying to fix has shifted, 
if that problem exists in Ethiopia, well, guess what? Pack up from Nigeria and move to Ethiopia because that's where the problem is. So we are seeing entrepreneurs that are, one, straightening up their houses, uh, two, that are sort of getting that grit to be able to ride through this storm and the headwinds. And three, if they can do those things and they found a product market fit, there's capital, and we see capital on the horizon, we deploy capital, and testament to our friends at No Nova Star, they've been able to also acquire more capital to deploy. So we don't think that it is the end of the world. We actually think we have come through the trough and we're starting to see uh, capital being deployed back in the marketplaces. Fantastic, thank you. I mean, that's, that's great news. Um, so Tony, do you, do you have any takers here as well? Sure. Yeah, sure I do. And maybe I'll start with situating the context of uh, what I think of as a startup, particularly in the VC context, um, you, or, or even the founder, you know, these are people who are extremely ambitious, extremely ambitious. So to the point that AK made earlier about these companies being in multiple markets, it's usually not the investor that is saying you need to be in five markets. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's usually the person who they're starting here, but you know their their picture is world domination. Like you know, they want to be in as many places as they can, be the number one in all the markets. That's not the reality, but you know that sort of ambition. Um, and then you need the agility, you need the grit, the resilience um, in any market, much much more so, you know, in markets like this. Um, but importantly, you also need people who can be very nimble operators you know it's one thing to have the vision the ambition but you need to actually be able to build and you need to be able to deliver sell you know and so that profile you will find is quite different from maybe like even a great growth sme um and the way you evaluate the risk of that is different they're building value very quickly so you know if the difference between investing this year and next year could be quite significant because the value they've built changes their price quite significantly as well. Um, and there's usually, I mean, it's usually driven by some idea around disruptive innovation, heavily leveraged, leveraging technology or driven by technology. Um, and so that's sort of like high level profile of between the founder or the business a, a lot of times of what we're thinking of. And it's rather, it's somewhat unique um, to find all of those things or enough of those things in, in one opportunity. But that's what um, um, we're usually looking for. Um, in terms of, of um, the comments around like the funding winter and, and how we think about that, I've, 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 again, markets are cyclical, right? So it was expected this would happen. The question is when, how long? Um, and the, hopefully, the idea has been that it will have a cleansing effect. You know, both on the side of entrepreneurs and on the side of investors, there was a little bit too much excitement and people getting carried away. And so I think, you know, it's always good to have, you know, cold water just <laughs> cool you down, you know, and that's what's happening. Um, and the great thing is that we see it in our portfolio, we see it across the ecosystem that there are companies who certainly their growth has been, has been, their growth profile has been affected by macro issues aside from the funding which are, which are actually separate. Um, but they're still growing, you know. Um, I was joking with someone last week saying that, you know, if you have a portfolio company that's flat in dollar terms, you're like, wow, man, these guys are, you know, really killing it, you know. So, you know, they're, 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 you see those signs that these businesses, to the point I made earlier, they're actually really resilient, some of them, you know. And what you expect is that as you come out of the winter and appetite increases um, to invest a bit more, you'll see those entrepreneurs being rewarded and those businesses being rewarded. Um, and rightly so, we think. Um, now, the the... The flip side to that is the question around how do you adapt some things more to the market, even in the near term, you know, those sort of things start to come up a lot more um, significantly. Um, the question about how do you start to mobilize, one, capital from local investors, and two, 
that capital in local currency, you know, is also starting to accelerate a lot more. Um, and the ecosystem will need that in the long term. You know, LATAM, Southeast Asia, um, East, Far East Asia, like these are all um, ecosystems that developed with a huge amount of local capital. I mean, till today, a lot of Western investors almost complain about the Indian market that it's difficult for them to come in and break in because, you know, it's heavily supported by local capital. Um, and so those sort of things are shifts that we think are important. And, you know, entrepreneurs like Sam was, was, was indicating that they've figured out how to get some support locally. Like those sort of things, I think, will help build the resilience as well. In terms of looking forward, some of the trends that we're excited about, I think obviously climate is a big one for us. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a narrative I often hear about how it's not really an Africa problem, it's not really a Nigeria problem, or, or we didn't cause it, so why should we be, you know, sort of um, um, saddled with the responsibilities of dealing with it? And I think, unfortunately, a lot of times people don't realize how issues that we see are either driven by or influenced by climatic factors, but it's just not obvious in that sense. So I'll give you one example, um, or a couple. You know, floods have wiped out communities, significant crops in the past two or three years, different situations leading to flooding in different areas, but those are climatic-driven events. Um, the, the water body of Lake Chad, that's a major water source for the north, particularly I think the northwest, um, is 80% of what it used, sorry, it's 20% it's of what it used to be in the 80s. So that means that, for instance, that's a big area where you have um, the nomadic herders, but the water is not there, so they are forced to come down south, and it's one of the contributing factors to the conflict that we see. Um, power generation, how is it going to be solved? Does anybody here think that it's going to be the GenCos that are going to do it over the next 10 years? No, especially with everything that's happening with dollar, price of diesel, you know, the government is signaling that they will and have to take away the power subsidy. And so renewable is going to become a big factor of that. Immobility as well. Petrol was, you know, May 29th, <laughs> 10 a.m. What you paid for petrol was different from what you paid for petrol 6 p.m. that same day, and it's different from what you're paying now. Um, and so we think that, again, looking over the next 10 years, um, the innovations that we're going to see coming into that climate link space will transform the African landscape, not because, not because um, climate is a thing, but because the way people have been living will not will not sort of be sustainable for the same people in the short to medium term. Before it was maybe a bit more long, medium to long term. Now, even in the short to medium term. And so we think that, you know, businesses like Money Point that we're also the largest institutional investor in, you know, um, that sort of innovative drive, yeah. we're already seeing it come into the climate space and we think it's a great time to start tapping into it. All right. Thank you very much, man. Um, so I think we would open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, do we have any questions apart from where you can send your deck to? I know that one of the um, outlooks for investing, one of them that wasn't particularly highlighted was compliance. And being in the winter cycle of investment, how much does compliance influence investing in local companies? And I want to ask this question against the backdrop that compliance is quite expensive in our country. So understanding that for there to be like regulatory compliance, these companies themselves have to have sufficient financial backing and then they are in the winter cycle and then compliance also influences your investments. How do you balance that? So who's the question for? Anyone on this panel can answer apart it as, as apart from me. Okay, so I'll answer it my way, which is compliance is a problem that has an opportunity. So we were actually actively involved on two compliance deals. Um, one is on uh, reducing the cost of significant compliance. So if you look at um, if you look at the enterprise, there are people that will pay 10 million, 15 million, 20 million naira for certain compliance aspects. 
but there are entrepreneurs that have digitized this now, which makes it a very fantastic opportunity. Uh, good thing is that it's not Nigeria specific, it's SaaS, it's global, makes sense. So it's a great opportunity there. Uh, the other is emergence. So what we are seeing is that there are some emerging environments on compliance that exist around social me media. So this is now global on a five billion stack. Uh, so that's something that we're really interested in and it's a deal that we're looking at. So when we look at tech and we invest in primarily five sectors, one of them is just pure tech. So this is a pure tech deal. We will take compliance, put it into that space. Uh, I think that it's those kinds of problems that when we started investing seven, eight years ago, we wouldn't have seen. People were building the Twitter for Nigeria and you're like, uh, good luck with that. But now you're seeing the emergence of real solutions that take problems and the nut that you have to pay for those problems and you shrink them down so it is more open to not just the large people in the stack, uh, but it's actually startups that need compliance, mid-tiers that need compliance, as well as the large corps. Thank you. Very much. Does that answer your question? Um, we have one person. Yeah. So hi, uh, my name is Olari Wachu, and my question is basically around the investment space. So if you're a tech company and you as a founder, you're just literally after, I don't want to do a Delaware C Corp. I, I, I literally think the ecosystem has gotten matured enough to the extent where we literally don't need it again. Uh, you should be able to, uh, I personally, I'm looking to IPO year. And you know, for investors, what would you say with regards to, you know, you have an investment and the guy just tells you, yeah, I would really like if you guys can, let's do it here and not do it Delaware C Corp. That's one. Uh, the next sorry, one. Sorry, one question. Oh, okay, okay then. Who are you directing the question to? What did you say? Who are you, who's the question uh, for? Anybody, anybody. Anybody. Yeah. Um, hey, do you want to take that? But I would like some clarity. So you, you want to do your IPO here as against raising foreign funds? We don't have issues with raising f foreign currency. The issue is we don't want to do a Delaware. I, 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 I'm not looking forward to my incomes are coming in local currencies and I have to you know, continue to ship money abroad. I, I am not interested in shipping cash abroad at all, at all. So if you're an investor, if you're looking to bring your cash here and denominate it back into my local currency and invest in me, completely fine. So my issue is I don't want to do a Delaware C Corp. Uh, we can do investment and every other thing, just not that one thing. So what's the question? Yeah, I think, I think we can help him clarify. You wanna, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, in terms of not doing a Delaware C Corp, there's something that you have to watch out for, right? Um, that might be your desire, but you have to look at the investor's desire. So you would need to call your investment base from a Nigeria base that is Naira denominated and it's comfortable in, in Naira. If you can't do that, or if you need follow on capital, or you need to expand past the Nigerian market, then you run into an issue. Now, the great thing is that for most of you, NGX is looking at doing a tech board. The tech board should go live middle of this year, Q3 and so on. Uh, we know because we're actively looking at some transactions there. Now, I think that give, creates an outlet for companies like yours that wants to have sort of Nigerian investors and believes that the only market it will serve or the primary market it will serve is an NGN denominated market, then it's fine. But the thing you have to really look out for is one, are all your investors coming from Nigeria? If they're coming from abroad, you will have to look at comfort around the vehicle. And people don't usually have comfort around Nigerian vehicles because they're not aware of the structures that we have. And two, if you need more capital, where is that capital coming from? If the local ecosystem cannot provide that capital, you need to go external. And if you go external and they can't fund you, 
great company that's growing, needs more capital, you can't get it, you fall into decline. So those are the things I would advise. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Okay, um, just to add on to that, uh, one thing is I, I really like where you're thinking from. As in, you're looking to match your receipts with your payouts. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense. And um, um, like, like he said, where your investors are coming from really matters. So if you're able to pitch to the local markets and you get the investments, then fine. But for, if you're going to get uh, part of the funding from foreign investors, uh, if you have a cash flow business already, you can speak to your bank. I mean, you can talk to a bank like Echo Bank to say, how can I mitigate exchange risk? What do I need to do to mitigate exchange risk? I mean, I'm, go I'm going to get like um, 10 million or 10 bucks from the US and um, the horizon is like a 10 year period. What sort of solution can I use to ensure that my receipts can actually pay this? So it's like buying a vehicle and buying insurance on that vehicle to say, I don't want to pay above certain sums because these are my cash flows and I need to match those receipts. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, I, I, yeah I just want to add another perspective to this as well, which is that while it is relevant to think about the currency you're raising in because your investors will benchmark in that currency, um, also to make sure that there's an understanding that with, with venture capital in particular, if you're taking equity, the investors are not asking, typically, the investors are not asking the business to actually tip, pay back. So it wouldn't be them taking cash out of the business. What they're expecting is that as you grow, the value of their investment in you and the shares they hold in your business will grow. And then they will find some other investor to buy those shares. And so it's usually not going to require money from the company directly. Um, there's still an FX risk that you have to manage, but just so that that's clear as well. Thank you very much. Um, his question actually opened up my head, and I have a lot of questions, but I, it's, I've, had, I've asked too many. Um, sorry, please, go ahead. That's probably the last question you can take. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Olamikwa Oladunjoye. I know, sorry. <laughs> we share the same surname, I know. <laughs> It's a pleasure to meet you. You might be my auntie. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Should direct your question to her, right? <laughs> um, actually, yes, yeah, sure. For you and then for if, and if anyone else could assist in the question. Um, there's a two-based question, very brief. Um, the first question is visibility. I literally found out about you yesterday, this program, right? And I've been looking for venture capitalists to raise a million plus dollars for the last probably four months. And I don't know if maybe that's how God works. You know, you're, <laughs> you get, God uses digital solutions to solve people's problems as well, not just human beings. But this literally just popped onto my, my email. In fact, it almost entered junk. So the first question I would ask is, the effort for visibility, if there are people like me that are just finding you by mistake, right? What is the efforts that all entities are really taking place to be seen so that the right people can actually find you. Because if I go on Google right now, UK government startup fund comes up, the US startup funds come up, they are running sponsored ads, they are running all these things. And before I can find anybody from Nigeria, you're probably on like number seven on the Google, set, Google O. So your search engine optimization is very, very low. So what, what can we do to solve that? And then the second question is, do you invest in dynamic tech startup solutions? So when I say dynamic tech startup solutions is, there are certain type of businesses like mine. So I run 24 hour supermarket and pharmacy businesses. Sorry, yeah. I don't mean to interrupt. I'm not pitching. <laughs> right. coming to pitch. Oh, <laughs> can, can, yeah. So can we take the first question about Go ahead. visibility? Yeah, sure. Afterwards, okay. you can always walk up to any of the investors. Or oh, so it's not a pitch, it's a serious question. Do you, I wanted to ask if you invest in retail technology, dynamic okay. retail technology. All right, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Could I ask, ahead, answer please. first? So with Endeavor Nigeria, um, we're actually a non-for-profit in the 42 markets we're in. Yeah. But we have what you call the Catalyst Fund. And the Catalyst Fund co-invests when our entrepreneurs are raising funds. So we wouldn't just invest in you because you're not an Endeavor um, entrepreneur. Right. That's, my own, that's my answer. 
Thank you very much. Um, to speak on visibility, um, I think I think the fund, uh, all the funds are maybe maybe it will help to join certain communities. I mean, you fund ABC, for instance. Ah, uh, we can. You can join ABC. You can join PBN. You can join the thousands of community. Okay, you know what? We can talk afterwards, and then I could give you a pointer to a few. But I think the, I think the funds do very well to push their their work. Um, Ashley does fantastic work. Um, Nova Star, and I think this brings us to the end of this panel. Thank you so much for your time and the interventions. I think the key takeaway for us will be um, it's not all doom and gloom, right? Because I think the advantage we get is that the quality of companies that will come through this cycle will be companies that can best any in the world, right? And the point is, if you can beat all the challenges we face, then you can definitely go all over and you know IPO in any country and all of that. Um, and I also think that the bottom line is just don't die between now and the time the wave comes in, right? Ensure that your unit economics are good um, as much as you can be cash efficient. And I'm talking to the founders here. And I'm sure Ike and uh, Anthony have, and uh, he too, even though he doesn't want to write any check, but I'm sure you can meet him. Thank you so much for your time um, and good afternoon. All right, thank you very much. Me, Mr. Ike, Ure, A, and back. Thank you very much. <laughs> Your name is really long. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Um, on behalf of, uh, we have to bring this round the session off. Um, on behalf of our partners, semicolon, Ashley, um, Africa Tech Expo, Clinton, and the US Consulate, thank you very much. And our sponsors, Echo Bank, Krispy Kreme, and Coca Cola, thank you very much. So, and possibly we would, be we would send um, the, a summary of each of the sessions on our next steps. Thank you very much, and have a great day. You can also, uh, there's, I think there's still food there, I think, yeah. All right, thank you very much. Cheers.